Now, President, I ask the committee to consider a list of 40 pending military nominations, including in this list is a nomination of General John E. Hyten, U.S. Air Force, for reappointment to the grade of general and to be commander, United States Strategic Command. All of these nominations have been before the committee. The required length of time. Is there a favor motion to favorably report these 40, million, 40 military <laughs> nominations to the Senate? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. The aye. Motion, motion carries. The Senate Armed Services Committee meets this morning to receive testimony on U.S. national security challenges and ongoing military operations. I'd like to welcome our witnesses, Secretary Carter and Secretary Dunford. Thank you for your service and thank you to the men and women you lead and their families for their service and sacrifice during these challenging times. This committee has conducted regular hearings on U.S. national security strategy and ongoing military operations. We have devoted special attention to the chaos engulfing the Middle East and the U.S. military campaign against ISIL. <coughs> it will be up to future historians to render a final judgment on this administration's stewardship of U.S. interests in the broader Middle East. But in the opinion of this one senator, it's been an unmitigated disaster. President Obama sought to pivot away from one of the most strategically vital regions of the world out of a misplaced hope that, quote, the tide of war was receding and that we should focus on, quote, nation building at home. That withdrawal of U.S. power created a vacuum that was filled by all of the worst actors in the region, Sunni terrorist groups such as al-Qaeda and ISIL, the Iranian regime and its proxies, and now Putin's Russia. Just consider, over the past eight years, this administration has overseen the collapse of regional order in the Middle East into a state of chaos where every country is either a battlefield for regional conflict, a party to that conflict, or both. The rise of ISIL and the threat it poses has made al-Qaeda appear modest by comparison. But both terrorist networks have expanded their influence from West Africa to South Asia and everything in between. The administration may have postponed Iran's nuclear programs, but this has come at the cost of unshackling Iranian power and ambition, both of which will grow in the coming years as billions of dollars in sanctions relief is transformed into advanced military capability and support for terrorism. And then there is Putin's Russia, which has reclaimed a position of influence in the Middle East that is not enjoyed in four decades. The best that can be said about this devastating legacy is over the past year, in part thanks to our witnesses today, President Obama has at least begun to unleash America's fighting men and women against ISIL. They are fighting with skill and courage despite enormous risks, as reports of ISIL's use of mustard agent against U.S. and Iraqi troops remind us. As a result, we are gradually eroding ISIL's territorial control and removing key personnel from the battlefield. This military campaign has too often been slow, reactive, and excessively micromanaged by the White House. Indeed, we read this morning of plans for yet another incremental increase of 500 troops in Iraq, one more step down the road of gradual escalation. But thanks to the tremendous talent and dedication of our men and women in uniform, we are making progress. I have no doubt that ISIL will eventually be expelled from its strongholds in Mosul and Raqqa. The day of liberation will come later than it should have, but it will come. This will be a tactical success, but it is unlikely to lead to strategic gains because the administration has failed to address and at times has exacerbated the underlying conflict. The struggles for power and sectarian identity now raging across the Middle East, ISIL is merely, merely a symptom of this deeper problem. In Iraq, Mosul may be retaken eventually, but that will only likely reignite the battle for the future of Iraq, a battle in which we have an important stake. The biggest problems still lie ahead, combating the malign influence of Iran and its militias, addressing the future of the Kurds and their place in Iraq, and attenuating the disenfranchisement of the Sunni Iraqis that gave rise, rise to ISIL in the first place. In Libya, 
we've had success in degrading ISIL stronghold in CERT. But what remains is a divided nation littered with independent militias, flooded with arms, and searching in vain for legitimate governance and political unity, conditions that will remain fertile grounds for extremism and anti-Western terrorism. We've also begun targeting ISIL in Afghanistan, but a resurgent Taliban, backed by Afghanistan's neighbors, continued to destabilize and terrorize the country, while Afghan National Army casualties remain unsustainably high. And yet it was in this environment that President Obama chose to withdraw another 1,400 troops. Nowhere, however, is America's strategic drift clearer than in Syria. After more than 400,000 dead and half the population driven from their homes, after the worst refugee crisis in the century, which now threatens the project of European unity, the administration still has no plausible vision of an end state for Syria. Instead, while Russian and Syrian regime aircraft bombed hospitals, markets, and aid warehouses, and other civilian targets, President Obama sent his intrepid but delusional Secretary of State to tilt yet again at the windmill of cooperating with Vladimir Putin, even committing to share intelligence with Russia for coordinated military operations. This agreement would be deeply problematic even if it were implemented. It would mean that the U.S. military would effectively own future Russian airstrikes in the eyes of the world. It would also strengthen Assad's military position in the country, thereby undermining our own strategic objective of a political transition. It appears that none of this will ultimately matter because once again, Assad and Putin are not holding up their end of the deal as nearly everyone predicted. Assad has declared an end to the ceasefire. Barrel bombs are falling again on civilians in Aleppo, and an airstrike reportedly carried out by Russia has killed 12 members of a UN humanitarian convoy. Nonetheless, administration officials are desperately trying to salvage this agreement, likely because they realize that without this diplomatic fig leaf, the abject failure of their Syria policy will be evident, and because they know, as does everyone else, that there is no plan B. This should be yet another lesson, as if we needed it, that diplomacy in the absence of leverage is a recipe for failure. Our adversaries will not do what we ask of them out of the goodness of their hearts or out of concern for our interests or the suffering of others. They must be compelled, and that requires power. Until the United States is willing to take steps to change the conditions on the ground in Syria, the war, the terror, the refugees, and the instability will continue. Such will be the unfortunate inheritance of our next president, a Middle East aflame where American influence has been squandered. America's adversaries neither respect nor fear us. America's friends are increasingly hedging their bets, and America's policy options have been significantly narrowed and worsened. What's worse, America's military will America's military will confront these daunting challenges with constrained budgets, aging equipment, depleted readiness, and a growing set of operational requirements driven by other escalating challenges in Europe and Asia. We are simultaneously asking our military to wage a generational fight against Islamist terrorism while rebuilding a ready and modernized force to deter and, if necessary, defeat great power or rogue state competitors in full-spectrum combat. I would be the first to admit that Congress is failing in, in it, to match resources to requirements, but the failure of the President is worse. After all, it is the duty of the Commander-in-Chief to be the strongest advocate for the needs of our military, but President Obama has been more interested in using the defense budget as a hostage to extract political concessions for greater non-defense spending. Secretary Carter, this may be one of your last appearances before this committee. I hope you will use the opportunity to offer some clear answers to these troubling questions. Senator Reid. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I would like to join you in welcoming uh, Secretary Carter and General Dunford and uh, giving 
the security challenges that face the United States, your appearances before the committee are always deeply appreciated and very timely, particularly this moment. Uh, while significant work remains to defeat ISIL, uh, the United States and coalition military operations have resulted in important gains in both Iraq and Syria. Most notably, ISIL has been driven out of a significant amount of the territory the group once held. In just the last few weeks alone, ISIL lost its hold on the city of Manbridge, a number of key border crossings in Syria, and several key towns in advance of the Mosul offensive in Iraq. The cumulative effect of these operations has been to cut off key lines of communication for ISIL, thereby restricting their ability to bring in additional fighters and move equipment and personnel across the battlefield. As a result, it appears that ISIL is under more pressure now than at any other time in the campaign. Unfortunately, in Syria, it appears that the cessation of hostilities is not going to hold, and we look forward to your assessment of the progress and the military aspects of this campaign and whether uh, there is a, a possibility of a renewed cessation of hostilities in the future. Our military commanders are also rightly focused on ensuring our military operations support the efforts of our diplomats and other policymakers to address the continuing political challenges in Iraq and Syria. Even after the coalition retakes Mosul and Raqqa, the work of our diplomats, military and intelligence community will not be over. Ensuring ISIL is dealt a lasting defeat will require not only continued military support, but also assistance in achieving the political reforms necessary to address the underlying causes of ISIL's rise. This will require that the civilian agencies of our government are provided the critical resources necessary to perform this work. With regard to Afghanistan, I support the President's decision to maintain approximately 8,400 troops in the country into next year. This decision sent an important message to the Afghans, our allies, the Taliban, and others in the region that the United States remains committed to ensuring a stable Afghanistan. We look forward to your assessment of this year's fighting season and what more we can do to support the development of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. Despite a challenging security and political environment, the Afghan National Unity Government continues to be a reliable partner for the U.S. and our allies. However, I remain concerned about continued reports of corruption in Afghanistan and the slow political progress on the border reform agenda. Both of these issues present a strategic threat to continued international support of Afghanistan. In light of these challenges, I hope you will also discuss the efforts of the United States and our allies to build institutional capacity and enable necessary reforms in Afghanistan. In Eastern Europe, Russia continues its pattern of confrontation and antagonistic behavior. They persist in the use of hybrid tactics to foment discord and political gridlock throughout the region. Their aviators have harassed U.S. ships and aircraft deployed to the region, and they continue to provide support and training to separatists in eastern Ukraine in violation of the Minsk ceasefire agreements. UCOM and NATO have undertaken robust efforts to deter such behavior. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on the progress of and future plans for such efforts. North Korea remains one of the most dangerous and difficult national security challenges that this country faces. Earlier this month, North Korea conducted its fifth nuclear test, demonstrating that the North Korean regime has little interest in resuming six-party talks. While we have made significant efforts to put strong and effective sanctions in place to curb North Korea's nuclear development, China's unwillingness to enforce those sanctions to the full extent of its ability has undermined U.S. and international efforts to bring North Korea in line. Finally, our long-term military strategy depends on a budget that focuses at least five years into the future. Last year, Congress passed the 2015 Bipartisan Budget Act, which provided the Department with budget stability in the near term. However, there is no budget agreement for fiscal year 2018 and beyond. Without another bipartisan agreement that provides relief from sequestration, the Department will be forced to submit a fiscal year 2018 budget that adheres to the sequestration level budget caps and could indeed would undermine our defense strategy, including the investments made to rebuild readiness and modernize platforms and equipment, and we must not let that happen. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen. Welcome, Mr. Secretary, and uh, this is the last time for this year, uh, we appreciate your, uh, you and General Dunford's appearances before the Armed Services Committee, and uh, we look forward to your and General Dunford's testimony. Thank you for both of you for your service to our nation. Secretary Carter. 
Thank you very much. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Reed, all the members of this committee, thank you for having us here. And, and, and Chairman and Senator Reed, thanks for taking the time to uh, talk with me before this hearing. I'm much, much appreciated as always. Uh, and for hosting uh, General Dunford uh, by, by my side where he is all the time and I'm very pleased and um, our country is very fortunate to have him. Similarly, I want to thank you for hosting the service chiefs last week. Um, I appreciated your comments to them about the inefficiencies and the dangers of continued budget instability and gridlock, as well as the risk of sequestration's looming return. I look forward to addressing those topics more today with you. I also appreciate your support for our men and women serving around the world, military and civilian alike. You always provide it. They are the finest fighting force the world <coughs> has ever known. They're the, no one else in the world is stronger, no one is more capable, more innovative, more experienced, and has better friends and allies than they. That's a fact, and a <coughs> fact that Americans ought to be proud of. As you know, DOD is currently addressing each of the five challenges that Chairman Dunford and I described to you in our budget testimony this spring and that the Chairman and Senator Reid have already touched on, namely Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and terrorism. And on the last, in the wake of this week's attacks in New York, New Jersey, and Minnesota, we remain as determined as ever to continue countering terrorists around the world who seek to do harm to our country and our personnel. More on that shortly. As Chairman Dunford and I testified this spring, we've been planning for our activities to be paid for by the 2017 budget that we have submitted and that we developed. That budget adhered to last fall's bipartisan budget deal in overall size. While in shape, it marked a strategic turning point for DOD, making breakthrough investments in new operational concepts, in pioneering technological frontiers, in reforming the DOD enterprise, and in building the force of the future. It also put a high premium on continuing to rebuild the readiness of our forces, requiring not only stable resources, but also time. Nothing is more important than readiness to me or to the service chiefs. And yet today, just eight days away from the end of this fiscal year, that budget has yet to be funded by Congress. I want to discuss that with you today, but because this hearing is partly about <coughs> ongoing military operations, let me begin with an operational update on our campaign to deliver ISIL a lasting defeat. Now, each time Chairman Dunford and I have appeared before this committee since back last October, I've described to you our coalition military campaign plan, which is focused on three objectives. The first is to destroy ISIL's, the ISIL cancer's parent tumor in Iraq and Syria, because the sooner we end ISIL's occupation of territory in those countries, that is, the sooner we destroy both the fact and the idea of an Islamic state based on ISIL's barbaric ideology, the safer all of the world will be. Now that's necessary, absolutely necessary. It's not sufficient. So our second objective is to combat ISIL's metastases everywhere they emerge around the world, in Afghanistan, Libya, and elsewhere. And our third objective is to help protect the homeland. This is mainly the responsibility of our partners in the FBI, the Justice Department, Homeland Security, the intelligence community, and state and local law enforcement. But DOD strongly supports them, and I'll, I'll address how momentarily. Since last fall, we've taken many steps to continually accelerate this campaign, all consistent with our strategic approach of enabling capable, motivated local forces, for that's the only way to ensure ISIL's lasting defeat. And while we have much more work to do, the results of our effort are showing. In Iraq, we've been enabling the Iraqi security forces in the Kurdish Peshmerga. After retaking Ramadi and establishing a staging base at Makmur, the ISF went on to take, retake Heat, Rutba, Fallujah, and the important airfield and town of Kiara, setting the stage to complete the envelopment of Mosul and the collapse of ISIL's control over it. 
In the last few days, the ISF became, began operations to retake Sharkat and other towns surrounding Mosul. And the final assault on Mosul will commence, as with previous operations, when Prime Minister Abadi gives the order. In Syria, our coalition has also enabled considerable results by our local partners. They retook Shaddadi, severing a key link between Raqqa and Mosul, and then Manbij City, clearing a key transit point for ISIL's external operations and plotters, and providing key intelligence, intelligence insights. Additionally, our ally Turkey is helping local Syrian partners clear their border region with ISIL. We're working shoulder to shoulder with the Turks, supporting these efforts from the air, on the ground, and with intelligence. And as we do so, we're managing regional tensions, tensions that we've foreseen, and keeping everyone focused on our common enemy, ISIL. Meanwhile, we're systematically eliminating ISIL's leadership with the coalition having, to, having taken out seven members of the ISIL senior shura, including its chief of external operations, Al-Adnani. He was one of more than 20 ISIL external operators and plotters we removed from the battlefield. We're also continuing to go after ISIL's attempts to develop chemical weapons as we continue to ensure that U.S. coalition and Iraqi troops are the, vigilantly protected from that threat. And just last week, in one of the single largest airstrikes of our campaign, we destroyed a pharmaceutical facility near Mosul that ISIL tried to use as a chemical weapons plant. We also continue to aggressively attack ISIL's economic infrastructure, oil wells, tanker trucks, cash storage, and more. And we continue to take the fight to ISIL across every domain, including cyber. With all this, we're putting ISIL on the path to a lasting defeat in Iraq and Syria particularly as we embark on a decisive phase of our campaign to collapse ISIL's control of Mosul and Raqqa. With respect to the Syrian civil war, I want to commend Secretary Kerry for working so tirelessly to seek an arrangement which, if implemented, would ease the suffering of the Syrian people and get Russia pushing at last for a political transition which is the only way to end the Syrian civil war. There remains a way to go to see if the terms of that arrangement can be implemented. Unfortunately, the behavior we've seen from Russia and Syria over the last few days has been deeply problematic. Let me turn to our second objective, combating ISIL's metastases. In Libya, thanks to U.S. precision airstrikes undertaken at the request of the Government of National Accord, ISIL's territory in CERT has now been reduced to a single square kilometer, and I'm confident ISIL will be ejected from there. Meanwhile, in Afghanistan, we worked with our Afghan partners to conduct a large operation against ISIL over the last two months, dealing the organization severe blows, killing its top leader, and degrading its infrastructure, logistics space, and recruiting, and there'll be more coming. Next, to help protect our homeland and our people, DOD continues to provide strong support to our law enforcement, homeland security, and intelligence partners. This is the number one mission of our Northern Command. And the U.S. military is supporting our partners in three critical ways. First, we're ensuring the protection of our personnel and the DOD facilities where they work and reside. Second, we're disrupting ISIL's external operations. More on that shortly. And third, we're also disrupting the flow of foreign fighters, both to and from Iraq and Syria. This is part of a broader effort within our coalition to not only stem the flow of foreign fighters, but also counter ISIL's online messaging, recruitment, and spread of its loathsome ideology. Going forward, the collapse of ISIL's control over Raqqa and Mosul, which we're confident our coalition will achieve, will indeed put ISIL on an irreversible path to lasting defeat. But after that, to take up a point that both the chairman and ranking member Reid made, there will still be much more to do. Political challenges will remain. For that reason, the international coalition's stabilization efforts cannot be allowed to lag behind our military progress. That's critical to making sure that ISIL, once defeated, stays defeated. Truly delivering ISIL a lasting defeat requires both strategic patience and persistence. 
We can't predict what will come after our coalition defeats ISIL, so we must be ready for anything, including any attempts by ISIL to remain relevant, if, even if only in the darkest corners of the Internet. Let me now address issues DOD faces as an institution and how you can help. We have three grave concerns related to processes here in Congress. One, budget gridlock and instability. Two, micromanagement and overregulation. And three, denial of needed reforms. As you've heard consistently from me and DOD senior leaders, all three are serious concerns. But here today, because of how close we are to the end of the fiscal year, I want to focus just on the first. We need Congress to come together around providing normal, stable, responsible budgets, because the lack of stability represents one of the single biggest strategic risks to our enterprise at DOD. That's why I've been talking about the major risk posed by budget instability for over a year and a half. You heard the same from the service chiefs last week. Such budget instability undercuts stable planning and efficient use of taxpayer dollars, often in ways taxpayers can't even see. It baffles our friends, boldens our foes. It's managerially and strategically unsound, and it's unfairly dispiriting to our troops, to their families, and our workforce. And it's inefficient for our defense industry partners, too. We're now eight days away from the end of the fiscal year. But instead of stability, we're going into fiscal year 2017 with yet another continuing resolution. This for the eighth fiscal year in a row. That's a deplorable state of affairs. And Chairman McCain, I appreciate your comments to our service chiefs about the damage the CR can do to our institution. As you know, the longer a continuing resolution lasts, the more damaging it is. It's not just a matter of money, but where the dollars are. For example, a CR that goes past December would undermine our plan to quadruple our European Reassurance Initiative at a time, as the chairman already noted, when we need to be standing with our NATO allies and standing up to deter Russian aggression. I know you will return here in November to pass defense appropriations and a National Defense Authorization Act. I look forward to working with you then. However, I cannot support any approach to the defense budget that moves us towards sequestration or away from bipartisanship and not at the expense of stability that comes with it. Not if it shortchanges the needs of our warfighters. Not if it means funding lower priorities instead of higher priorities. Not if it undermines confidence in the ability to pass bipartisan budget deals, which could lead to the imposition of sequestrations, $100 billion in looming automatic cuts to us. And not if it adds extra force structure that we can't afford to keep ready in the long term, which would only lead to a hollow force. I'm confident and hopeful that we can come back together again. Today, America is fortunate to have the world's greatest military. I know it, you know it, our friends and allies know it, and critical, critically, our potential adversaries know it too. Only with your help can we ensure that my successors can say the same and that what is today the finest fighting force the world has ever known remains that way for years to come. Thank you. General Dunford. Chairman McCain, uh, Ranking Member Reed, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to join Secretary Carter this morning. Before offering a brief assessment of ongoing operations, I'd like to associate myself with the comments made by the service chiefs who testified before this committee last week. As you'd expect, they'd offered their candid assessment about the readiness and the modernization challenges that affect each of the services. And I fully concur with their assessment of the operational tempo and the budget challenges faced by each of the services and across the department. But due in large part to this committee's support, the Joint Force remains the most capable and professional military in the world. We can defend the nation, we can meet our alliance responsibilities, and today we have a competitive advantage over any adversary. I think that's an important point that should not be lost on our allies, it should not be lost on our enemies, and it should not be lost on the men and women of the Joint Force, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen. And I say all that mindful that we remain confronted with challenges from traditional state actors and violent extremism. 
Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea continue to invest in military capabilities that reduce that competitive advantage. They are also advancing their interests through adversarial competition that has a military dimension that falls short of armed conflict. Examples include Russian actions in the Ukraine, North Korea's nuclear saber rattling, Chinese activities in the South China Sea, and Iran's malign activities across the Middle East. In different ways, each of these nations leverage economic coercion, information operations, cyber capabilities, unconventional warfare, and force posture deliberately seeking to avoid a U.S. military response. Meanwhile, non-state actors such as ISIL and al-Qaeda remain a threat to our homeland, the American people, our partners, and our allies. As evidenced by this past weekend's attacks, such extremist groups seek to inspire and radicalize others, and in doing so, they're attempting to fundamentally change our way of life. The joint force is engaged in responding to each of these strategic challenges. We're focused on deterring potential adversaries, and we're prepared to respond should deterrence fail. We also remain firmly committed to defeating ISIL and its affiliates wherever they may emerge. Since my last appearance before the committee, I've made additional trips to the Middle East, and I'm encouraged by the coalition's progress in Iraq and Syria. We've also degraded the Islamic State's capabilities in Libya, West Africa, and Afghanistan. <clears throat> coalition operations supporting indigenous ground forces, and, and the chairman mentioned this, rank, Ranking Member Reid mentioned, the secretary did, have disrupted core ISIL's ability to mount external attacks, reduced its territorial control, limited its freedom of movement, eliminated many of their leaders, and reduced the resources that they have available. Most importantly, the coalition has begun to discredit ISIL's narrative and its aura of invincibility. Well, more work remains to be done, and we're by no means, by no means are we complacent. It's clear we have the momentum in the military campaign. As the Joint Force addresses each of our strategic challenges, we also recognize the need to invest in the future. As the Secretary said, we don't have the luxury of choosing between the challenges that we face today or the challenges that we most assuredly will face tomorrow. To meet tomorrow's requirements, we must take action today. Our nuclear deterrent remains effective, but it is aging and requires modernization. At the same time, we must develop and enhance the capabilities that in the increasingly contested domains of space and cyber. And we must also do all that while we preserve the edge in our conventional capabilities. In the end, we must maintain a balanced inventory of joint capabilities and capacities to meet the full range of challenges that we will confront. In closing, I am concerned about readiness today, but I'm more concerned about maintaining a competitive advantage in the future. If we fail to modernize the joint force, we will be at a disadvantage in the future. And I know the committee shares my belief that we should never send our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, or Coast Guardsmen into a fair fight. Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you very much, General. Uh, thank you for your comments about the testimony of the service chiefs. We appreciated it, too. We were shocked. Uh, or at least surprised to learn that none of the service chiefs have had a conversation with the President of the United States. That's the first time I've ever heard of it in my years of service and membership of this committee. In General Dunford, in your professional military opinion, is a Russia is a Russian in a quagmire in Syria? Uh, it's not clear to me that Russia is in a quagmire in Syria at this time. Chairman. In your professional military opinion, is the cessation of hostilities agreement being effectively implemented on the ground in Syria? Uh, that, would not, that would not appear to be the case over the last 48 hours, Chairman. This is not the first time we've had one of these agreements. In fact, it, uh, it's beginning to fit the definition of insanity of doing the same thing over and over again. Suppose this fails again, General Dunford. What, what do we do then? try another ceasefire? What, what do we do then? We just saw, as you know, uh, evidence that a chemical weapon, and we knew that a chemical weapons factory was uh, functioning in Raqqa. Uh, what, what, what's plan B? Is there a plan B here, or do we just keep going back to the five-star hotels in Geneva and have uh, meetings uh, with our count, with uh, Mr. Lavrov and uh, come out with various declarations. What, what do we do if this, if this one fails? Chairman, we have a wide range of uh, military options. Give us one. The, uh, Chairman, uh, if I could finish, 
uh, we have a wide range of military options that we would provide to the President uh, should our policy change in the wake of this recent cessation. Is the President's policy working? Uh, against ISIL, the President's policy is in working. In Syria, with 400,000 people killed, 6 million refugees, is our strategy in Syria working, succeeding? With regard to the political transition in Syria at this time, I with would say. With regards to the whole situation in Syria, is our policy working? Uh, Chairman, I, I'd let others address the policy. Our focus from a military perspective is I'm on asking, the I'm asking, is our campaign. military strategy succeeding in Syria? Our military strategy is focused on the kind of campaign. In my judgment, we are succeeding in that campaign. So, as far as you're concerned, we ignore the 400,000 dead and the 6 million refugees. That's caused by Bashar Assad. Do you believe that right now it's very likely that Bashar Assad will leave power? Uh, I, I can't really judge that right now. It doesn't appear that he will in the near term, Chairman. So you can't judge that? Uh, I can't judge the long-term prospects for, for Assad, was my point, Chairman. I, in the short term? he's not leaving in the short term. Uh, in your professional military opinion, is it a good idea to share, set up an intelligence sharing operation with the Russians? Chairman, we, we don't have any intention of having an intelligence sharing arrangement with the Russians. That is part of Secretary Kerry's proposal, that we set up an intelligence sharing operation in Syria with the Russians. Chairman, the, the U.S. military role will not include intelligence sharing with the Russians. Do you support such an idea that they should uh, share intelligence, military intelligence information with Russia and Syria? Chairman, what the, what the President has directed us to do is establish a joint implementation I was asked for your professional military opinion, not what the President has told you to do. I'm asking, as in your confirmation hearings, if you would give your professional military opinion to this committee in response to questions. I expect you to hold to that. It is, it, is it your professional military opinion that it would be a good idea to have an intelligence sharing operation with Russia in Syria? Chairman, I do not believe it would be a good idea to share intelligence with the Russians. I thank you, General. Uh, on the issue of uh, sequestration, could I just mention, uh, I hope it got the attention of all of my colleagues that uh, every one of the service chiefs said that presently sequestration puts our men and women who are serving in military in greater risk. At the same time, the President of the United States is demanding, uh, is putting uh, the risk to American servicemen and women at the same level as uh, funding for the EPA. Uh, and so it is just uh, remarkable uh, to a lot of us that we don't take care of the compelling argument of caring, of reducing the risk of the men and women who are serving the military, demanding that there be non-defense uh, increases in spending at, at the same time. Uh, all I can say is I thank you, Secretary Carter and, and General Dunford, but this, this latest uh, information concerning a chemical shell obviously shows that uh, in Raqqa they're doing a lot of things, including a chemical weapons factory, which adds a new dimension to the threat to the lives of the men and women who are serving in the military. I still look forward to hearing from Secretary Carter and General Dunford, what is the strategy if the present strategy continues to utterly fail? And frankly, I haven't heard that. Senator, Senator Reid. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary and General Dunford, uh, one of the factors that appears to be influenced the timing of the Mosul operation is to how do you govern Mosul after you militarily uh, succeed, Iraqi security forces succeed with American and coalition assistance. And that triggers uh, the issue of not only the role of agencies outside defense, like the State Department, AID, and others, uh, but the resources they have. Um, it would be necessary, is it necessary in your view that these agencies be robustly funded in addition because without them, you can have a military victory and essentially just wait around because they'll come back because you haven't put the politics and the capacity together? It, it is necess necessary. I had the 
defense ministers of the key coalition contributors here to Andrews a little while ago. And we went through, as we always do, the campaign, their role, uh, including the, the moves to envelop Mosul, which we've now taken. Uh, their biggest concern with the campaign at this point uh, in Iraq is exactly the one you note, namely, is the political and the economic lagging so far behind the military that there's going to be an issue once Mosul is, uh, uh, once ISIL is ejected from Mosul. And I'm just very specifically, if I may, uh, Senator, take the political part and then the, then the, then the, the re stabilization reconstruction part. On the political part, <clears throat> Uh, this is a question that recurs actually everywhere we go. Uh, everywhere we enable forces to defeat ISIL, the, the people who live there say, well, what's going to happen afterwards? And that's something we have dealt with in heat, Fallujah, Rupa, and so forth. They're all complicated, all different. Mosul's going to be different, too. My understanding, and, and that's just not mine, but the chairman's and, and the... And the um, our commanders there and also the presidents with Prime Minister Abadi, uh, President Barzani, who are contributing forces, the Peshmerga from the north, uh, uh, a couple of brigades, and the ISF from the south for the envelopment and collapse of control on, of ISIL's control on Mosul. Uh, our understanding with, with them, which they are both adhering to is that neither of the forces that will participate in taking Mosul should be the hold and govern force there. They should be local police, uh, Sunni in many cases, but it's actually a mixed ethnicity city, and the governor of Ninawa province is the one that they are working with and we're working with. That's a daily exercise for General Townsend, General Votel, and, and for us, is to keep everybody aligned and focused on, on the job at hand, which is defeating ISIL. With respect to stabilization and reconstruction, we don't know what the uh, uh, a, a collapse of ISIL's control over Mosul will look like. We've had a different experience in different cities, um, and obviously no one wants to see a street-to-street -street fighting in Mosul, but you don't know. Uh, there could be a large number of re refugees, and we're preparing for that. Not USAID, you mentioned U.S. government funding, uh, that's essential, but also the U.N. Right. and other international aid, aid agencies. And I should say, by the way, that's one of the things I ask our coalition partners. I say, if you don't want to make a military contribution or you don't have a strong military contribution to make, or it's problematic for some historical or political reason for you to make a contribution, uh, a check is good. Uh, to but, the local people to help them reconstruct. But essentially, uh, you cannot, you, you can conduct kinetic operations, but the real long-term effort is uh, political, economic relief, refugee uh, uh, support, et cetera. Those are funds outside the Department of Defense. So a comprehensive approach to all these problems requires relief, not just from the Department of Defense spending, but for other federal agencies. It, is, that it, it is. The whole counter-ISIL thing is a whole and government. Let me, and going back also to your question about Northern Command. Northern Command is critical to defense of the United States, but without a robust Department of Homeland Security, without adequate uh, uh, resources, the FBI, and for other domestic agencies, then you could be performing at uh, peak efficiency, but the job would not get done. Is that we, correct? We, it, it, that is true. We count on their support. We support them as well. It's a whole of government uh, uh, effort, the feat of ISIL. And, and General Gunford, do you concur from your perspective? Uh, I do, Senator. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me start off by saying that we have rules in this committee that when we have witnesses coming in, we're to get their written statement 48 hours in advance. Now, we didn't get both of yours until 8.30 this morning. Uh, now, we did a lot better with the chiefs last week. In fact, General Hyten was in uh, 72 hours in advance. So I just think it's a good idea to pass on to others that, uh, before they come in that we really do need to have that to conduct the, uh, a hearing that's, that's meaningful. Um, when uh, General Goldfin was here, 
he described what's needed for defense funding, and he talked about sufficient, stable, predictable funding. Uh, in your statement, Secretary Ca Carter, you left the word sufficient out, and I'm, I am concerned about this uh, back during the Clinton administration when they were actually trying to uh, cut uh, 400 uh, out of the budget, we in this committee, and sitting in this, these, this uh, dais here, were able to put 100 uh, back in. And uh, you remember the famous bathtub chart that we used at that time. General Milley said last week, and I think he said it best, he, he said, quote, the only thing more expensive than deterrence is actually fighting a war. The only thing more expensive than fighting a war is losing a war. And we're expensive, we recognize that, but the bottom line is it's an investment that's worth every nickel. I guess the question, just for a short answer if uh, each one of you, is our defense funding levels kept pace with the realities of the, our environment out there? General Dunford? Uh, Senator, I, I don't believe they have, and that's, that's why we've articulated an increased requirement in, in uh, FY17, and we'll continue to reinforce those areas that we identified in 17 for 18. And of course, uh, those, those, we'll, we'll turn it over to Secretary. I appreciate that. Do you agree? I, I, yeah, and I wanted to right. say that I agree with General Dunford and what the, the Chief said as well. And uh, insufficiency belongs with, with, with instability, so I'm sorry if I left that word out, nothing intended there. The point that they were making and that I would strongly echo is the effects of eight straight years of ending a fiscal year without an appropriation yeah, you, you, the next, that, that, that. Is, has had a serious effect. We've tried to manage through it. We've right. done our best, but it, that, that's just not I the way to run an airline. Carter. Now, you've been, now, uh, let me compliment you, you've been a real stalwart when you're in support of each leg of the nuclear triad and have stated that the nuclear mission is the bedrock of our security. Today, we're spending about 3 to 4 percent of our, of our budget. However, the long-term plan shows that we're going to move up within the decade or sometime in the decade to 6 to 7 percent. Uh, the question I would ask is, uh, you know, General Dunford, with Russia and China actively modernizing their nuclear weapons and delivery system, we know what's happening in North uh, Korea. Uh, do you think we should accelerate this so that we would, would reach this 6 to 7 percent much earlier, like now? Senator, I, I think, as you know, many of those programs, it's not just a function of accelerating the funding, it's how much time it takes for development. And I'm confident, having looked at this very closely, that the path that we're on and the timing for the in introduction of our new programs is about right. It balances uh, both the budget, but it more importantly balances the operational readiness of those systems to be introduced. Well, the I, I think what you're saying is even if you had more now, you could not spend it wisely. You needed uh, the, the course that we're on is adequate in your uh, your opinion. Senator, that's that's exactly my assessment. All right, that's fine. Uh, the, uh, I was in uh, Ukraine right after their parliamentary elections, and I was, I've never seen Poroshenko or any of them as happy as they were at that time, how proud they were for the first time in 96 years not having one communist on the, on the, in, in parliament. And yet, as soon as that happened, Putin started killing the Ukraines, and the, uh, the, I would ask you this, uh, Secretary Carter, if is deterrence of Russia in Europe a policy priority? It, it absolutely is. That's why we quadrupled the European Reassurance Initiative. But, well, that, I would ask you the question, why are we not providing defensive lethal assistance to Ukraine? Well, that, that is... Uh, still on the table. It's been on the table for quite some time. Well, it's more than on the table with us we do, it's in our Well, it's going to depend upon what the, the Russians do with respect to uh, Minsk. I just met with my Ukrainian counterpart uh, a couple of weeks ago, a uh, great guy, by the way, who's been doing yeah. this for a long time and, and is uh, a very, very dedicated, good guy to work uh, with. And we talked about everything that we're doing with them. We have training do, have training now. We've no. moved from their National okay. Guard and to their regular. I don't want to be rude, a lot Mr. Of Secretary, but my time has just about expired. Okay. And I just want to know if, if this, well, let me ask you, General Dunford, uh, if we were to change our policy, what type of weaponry would be the uh, appropriate right now? You know, we have the Javelin anti-armor weapons. What would be the right weapon? And you're both fully aware that in our defense authorization bill, we address this issue because we support uh, lethal uh, defense weapons. 
General Lambert. The critical cap capability areas the Ukrainians have identified include fire support, their artillery capability, as well as their anti-armor capability. Yeah. And do you agree with that? That that's a capability gap. I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to join in thanking both of you for your extraordinary service and for your very forthright answers to our questions here. Uh, General Dunford, is there any question in your mind, any doubt, that Russian planes were responsible for attacking the United States, con the UN convoy that was trying to deliver aid to Aleppo? Senator, my, my, I don't have the facts. What we know are two Russian aircraft were in that area at that time. My judgment would be that they did. Uh, there were also some, some other aircraft in the area that belonged to the regime at or about the same time. So I can't conclusively say that it was the Russians, but it was either the Russians or the regime. Well, it sounds to me like you're saying that uh, their responsibility was demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt. Senator, there is no doubt in my mind that the Russians are responsible. Uh, I just don't know whose aircraft actually dropped the bomb. So I, I, I would, I would uh, certainly associate myself with the comment that you made earlier that, yes, it is the Russians that were responsible. Which is a war crime. I'm not asking for your legal judgment, knowing that uh, you would probably disclaim your expertise as a lawyer, but you would agree with me as a layman, as a military person that that act constituted a war crime. It was an unacceptable atrocity, Senator. Uh, would you agree with Secretary Kerry in contending that what ought to be done is a grounding of all aircraft in certain areas of Syria, including that one? I, I would not agree that coalition aircraft ought to be grounded. I do agree that Syrian regime aircraft and Russian aircraft should be grounded. Would you agree with apparently the growing strain of thought in the administration that the Syrian Kurds should be armed? Uh, Senator, we're in deliberation about exactly uh, what to do with the Syrian Democratic Forces right now. We have provided them support. They are our more, most effective partner on the ground. It's very difficult, as you know, managing the relationship between our support for the Syrian Democratic Forces and our Turkish allies. And so we're working very closely uh, with our Turkish allies to come up with the right approach to make sure that we can uh, conduct effective and decisive operations in Raqqa with the Syrian Democratic Forces and still allay the, Turkish, con Kurdish con the uh, Turkish concerns about the Kurds' long-term political prospects. If those concerns can be allayed, and even if they can't be allayed, would you agree that arming the Syrian Kurds presents an opportunity for us as a military option to be more effective in that area. Senator, I would agree with that. Uh, if we would reinforce the Syrian Democratic Forces' current capabilities, that will increase the prospects of our success in Raqqa. Uh, in terms of the uh, Russian responsibility for what you have absolutely correctly termed an atrocity, a war crime, in that area, what can the United States do? What are some of those military options that the chairman asked you about? Senator, I, I'd prefer to talk to you in private about military options that might be uh, might be being discussed as uh, as future options the president may have. Uh, I think right now managing the Russian problem is largely a political diplomatic problem, and and that's what Secretary Kerry and the president are dealing with. Uh, let me turn. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you mentioned that uh, there are three areas, uh, the fiscal, the overregulation or micromanaging, and much needed reforms, as you characterize them. Could you give us your priorities as to what those reforms would be? Uh, I have spelled, I have a number of concerns, uh, which I spelled out at great length in a letter to the committee. Um, and uh, I really look forward to working with you to resolve them. Uh, there, there, there are a number of them. Uh, they're serious uh, concerns that I have for uh, provisions in the bill, and I'd like to work all of these, I think, where we, we have common intentions, work them to a place where I can support 
uh, an NDAA that the president uh, would sign. That's where I'd like to get with you all by the time you return in November. I would welcome that opportunity. Uh, I'm just about out of time. This topic is immensely important because it involves effective use of resources. We talk a lot about what the levels of resource should be, but managing them effectively is very important. As to the Syrian conflict, uh, to both of you, uh, I don't need to emphasize how desperately serious the humanitarian cat catastrophe is in Syria. Uh, the chairman has rightly referred to the numbers killed and displaced. It is, as Secretary Kerry rightly termed it, probably the biggest humanitarian catastrophe since World War II. And the United States bears a responsibility to use its military forces to stop the bloodshed and the needless and senseless killing of innocent civilians there. So thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would uh, share that thought. The uh, situation in Syria is a colossal disaster. I do not believe it had to happen. I believe a wise statesman uh, could have foreseen some of the difficulties we're uh, facing today. And we should have been more cautious and careful in our declarations of how we expect Syria to develop over the years. It hadn't developed like President uh, Obama projected, and disaster has been the situation. Um, with regard to the sequestration issue, uh, Mr. Secretary, I've tried to contain spending on all our accounts. I've come to believe that we have to have more defense spending, um, and uh, we've exceeded sequestration, I guess, for the last two years. But I guess my question to you is, Senator McCain has proposed an increase in defense spending. All the items that he proposed are things the Defense Department have said they need. And um, uh, is it your position that the, and is it the President's position that we will not spend that additional money for the Defense Department unless at least an equal amount of money is spent on the Commerce Department, the EPA, and other government agencies? Well, what, what, uh, speak for myself, what I can't support and won't support is anything that moves towards instability, and that means towards sequestration, and that means away from bipartisanship. We, su we submitted a budget that r was consonant with a bipartisan budget agreement. That's what we did. Well, Eight okay. months. We so did I that a few it, months it, into it, the bipartisan budget. All right. Uh, agreement, and I, the, I, it, I, can't, I don't control this. I simply the president's it. decision. Ultimately, I understand that. So what he's saying in leading the Democrats, and they're saying not only do we have to bust the budget for the Defense Department, we have to bust it an equal amount for non-defense spending. That's the problem we have today. That's why we don't have a bipartisan agreement. So we can go on to the next subject. Well, there is a bipartisan, if I may say so, there is a bipartisan budget agreement, and that is what we uh, submitted our budget in accordance with, uh, uh, whatever, eight months ago. And well, now the fiscal year ends, and there's no, well, we'll there's have no budget to, uh, on that basis. Well, we'll have to avoid a government shutdown, and the leadership of the president and his determination, a compromise has bitterly been reached. I wish we could have supported defense without uh, going further. Mr. Secretary, um, Secretary Rumsfeld, Secretary Gates, and you have uh, criticized our allies in Europe about their unwillingness to even meet their minimum commitments to defense. I suppose you still believe they should meet those minimum standards, do you Yeah, not? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. They and said you've said that before. Uh, yep. But this re European Reassurance Initiative, a European official told me, why did not the United States demand that Europe increase their defense, defense spending at the same amount we're increasing our defense spending for Europe in the European Reassurance Initiative. Well, uh, all I can tell you is, yes, I am in a long tradition, and it actually goes back before Don. Now my question uh, is, uh, 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 why didn't you not tell the Europeans? I did. And, I did. Uh, we, well, we've been we, didn't, we don't have a commitment from them to match that amount of money, do we? Well, 
uh, it's complicated because some, each of them has made a contribution to European reassurance. But you're, in terms of aggregate spending, they have a commitment which not many of them have met, Senator, but a few have, Four out uh, of about which is to, meet, which is to spend 2 percent of their GDP. And important major countries in Europe aren't even doing that. And uh, uh, th that's unacceptable. With it means that Europe, too many European militaries have made it themselves incapable of independent well, I'll uh, just say military this. activity. For the last uh, 8 to 12 years, uh, they've continued on this, and we've said it, and nothing's happened. It's time for something to happen from Europe. Let me ask you, really, about the Syrian situation. It's such a disaster. I mean, we've got thousands, hundreds of thousands dead, six million refugees, and I don't see an end in sight. Uh, General Dunford just said that Assad is not leaving anytime soon. Five years ago, the president said Assad has to go and is going. He did not go. And this is all a result of that. Uh, so now we're making some progress, I understand, uh, against ISIS. Uh, what kind of agreement, what kind of end do you see, Mr. Uh, Secretary, for this disastrous conflict? How, how, how can we see an end to it? What do you foresee and what's our goal? We are making progress in the counter-ISIL campaign in Iraq and Syria. In, uh, in Western Syria, where the civil no, no, no. war No, no, no. I'm rages, asking, what is, what is the goal of the United the States of, of the America Uni the for goal, Syria? The goal of United States policy in Syria is to end the Syrian war, civil war. It has been that for a long time. Uh, and that means an uh, end to the violence there, That's, and also a political transition from Assad to a government that includes the moderate opposition and that can run the country. Our approach has been the a political problem one. Is, let me ask you this. Uh, it seems to me that the problem is that uh, with our support, ISIS is being uh, damaged, uh, but they're not utterly destroyed, if some sort of a, a peace agreement is reached, some sort of ceasefire, and the United States and others reduce their presence there, can you assure us that ISIS, the toughest, meanest group in Syria, won't be able to destabilize any a government that might be put together? Well, let me be clear about something, which is our counter-ISIL campaign is not on the table or part of the discussions of Secretary Kerry with the Russians. That is about the Russian activity, Syrian activity in Western Syria. Our counter ISIL campaign, we are conducting and will conduct. And you're right, we are making progress in it. Uh, and that's going to well, go on. But I don't what Secretary see, uh, Kerry's trying to do, and, and Again, as we sit here today, uh, it, it's very problematic. But what he's trying to do is exactly what you're calling attention to, namely to uh, end the humanitarian disaster occasioned by the civil war in Syria and to promote a political transition. Well, he's trying to then, work with those who have up influence and there, time's over, and, they're not, and they're not exercising that influence. I believe we could have done a better job with safe zones I'm worried about the area in Iraq. I've talked to you previously and personally about it. Uh, we need an active American policy, a leadership in the world, but we cannot establish all these governments uh, and run them and assure uh, how they'll come out in the end. And we can't, we can't occupy these countries for decades to try to assure that. That's just not realistic. A wise statesman would have seen the danger in Syria. A wise statesman would have seen the danger in Libya. A wise statesman should have seen what could have happened in Egypt. And except for 30 million Egyptians going to the uh, public square and driving out the Muslim Brotherhood, we could have a disaster there. Uh, we've got to be more realistic in our foreign policy. Uh, we've got to know what we can do to affect positively the world and what we cannot do. And we're not able to ensure democratic governments throughout this region of the world. And um, we're now facing a colossal 
humanitarian disaster, and uh, it's been bubbling for a number of years, and there's no easy solution to get out of it. I wish it were, but there's not. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of Chairman McCain, let me recognize Senator King. Thank you. An observation about the budget. Uh, a year and a half ago, we had a bipartisan agreement on the budget number. And then allocations were made to the Appropriations Committee, and they went through their process. And uh, I thought, finally, some stability. We can have appropriations. Uh, but I'm reminded of an old saying in Maine, uh, he's so dumb he could screw up a two-car funeral. Uh, we had the numbers, we had the allocations, we had the agreement, and yet here we are at a continuing resolution. I think we ought to be clear about what it is that's gotten us here. There is a dispute, as Senator uh, Sessions pointed out, on the numbers, but that's the kind of thing that could be negotiated. If there's an $18 billion that's been added to defense and there are people that feel that on the domestic side there also needs to be increases in areas like the FBI, for example, uh, that's a legitimate area that uh, reasonable people in an afternoon should be able to figure out. What's really holding things up, as I understand it, are riders that have nothing to do with the budget that have to do with policy preferences of various individuals. A perfect example is the National Defense Authorization Act, which my understanding is is now being held up by the sage grouse. The sage grouse is what is stopping the finalization of the National Defense Authorization Act. A very important issue to a lot of people. I'm not denigrating it. I know it's very important in the West, but it should not be the thing that holds up the National Defense Authorization Act and the support of our men and women uh, all, over the, all over the world. So I think we ought to be clear about what the problem is here, that, that trying to load on a lot of political uh, baggage uh, to both the appropriations bills and the national defense bill is what has gotten us uh, to this place. The numbers have been agreed on by a year, for a year and a half. And if we want to increase them, let's discuss that and work out an agreement. That should be easy. But to be holding up this, uh, and, and the, similar to the sage grouse, other kinds of the, those issues are what my understanding is it's holding up the appropriations process. So we're doing a continuing resolution, even though we've had a number agreed on for two years, for a year and a half. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, th this institution, as Senator Lindsey Graham pointed out last week, is one of the greatest threats to American security. He went through a litany of how we've taken more troops off the, off the battlefield, more airplanes out of the air, more ships out of the ocean than any enemy has done uh, by our inability to work out what ordinary people on the street would think people ought to be able to, to, to uh, uh, to figure out in a relatively short period of time. If you can find a question in there, you're welcome to it. Uh, uh, I, I would like to say one thing, which is just to repeat that it is on the basis of that bipartisan budget agreement and the stability it promised that we submitted our budget. Right. Now, and, and that we, we figured that was the best the country could do on a bipartisan basis. That's the only way we've had stability in the past. Now, I'm asked about this proposal and that proposal that would depart from that. And my, my, my answer is, in all seriousness, with responsibility for, for trying to shepherd this institution, is I have to look at what I think can be delivered sure. in a, on a stable basis. That was what the bipartisan budget agreement is, and that is the uh, that has been the foundation and remains the foundation for our budget submission. We did uh, a very good job, in my judgment, and this is the senior uh, leadership of the department, to uh, manage responsibly within that budget. We've done that. That's the budget we submitted months ago for I this fiscal year, and now the fiscal year ends. And so we've played it very straight. Uh, and, and my and point is we had a budget agreement, we had a number, and we still can't get it done. Let me ask an entirely different question. Next week we are probably going to be dealing with a veto of the bill that would allow people to sue Saudi Arabia, uh, the so-called Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act. General Dunford, do you have, con or, or both of you, do, do you have concerns about what the effect on our troops, our liability around the world would be if that bill becomes law? Let me, if I may, I'll say something. Sure. First, then General Dunford, if he wishes to. The, uh, uh, first of all, I completely associate myself with the intention of this, which is to honor the families of the 9-11 uh, 
uh, uh, perished, and so that that is the origin of this, and that's that is a, a, a worthy uh, one. I, I, it is a law enforcement matter, and I have to say we're we, we're not the, uh, the 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 ones who are dealing with it, nor are am I at least an expert on it. But you did raise one thing that I am aware of, which is a complication, from that would be a complication from our point of view, namely that. Were another country to behave reciprocally towards the United States, that could be a problem for some of our service members. Uh, that is, I'm told, a something that we in the Department of Defense should be concerned about, and uh, you're referring to that, and uh, uh, that's my understanding as well. Let me ask the chairman if he wants to add anything. Senator, the potential second order effect the secretary has raised is one that has been brought to my attention, so that, that's my concern as well. I think I think it would be helpful if if you could give us more detail on that uh, on that issue because we're going to be having to make a decision probably next week, uh, and I for one want to be sure I understand the full implications uh, uh, of that decision, uh, not only on the on the victims' families but also on other other U United States interests around the world. So I'd appreciate it if that could be made available in in the in the next few days. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On behalf of the Chairman, Senator Ayotte, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I want to thank you both for your service and leadership for the country. Uh, you know, just to briefly weigh in on this funding issue, what's been most disappointing to me as someone who supported the bipartisan budget agreement is that the defense appropriations bill passed within that cap set by the bipartisan budget agreement unanimously out of the Appropriations Committee. So both parties agreed with the funding on defense. Then it came to the Senate floor, and it's been blocked multiple times because it's being held hostage to other issues. So just to be clear, um, what you're asking for, it's there. And it's just disappointing to people like me um, and others here because the priority of defending this nation and having the funding for our troops and what you need to do should be our priority no matter what. So, um, you know, as I hear this kabuki dance, it's obvious we passed an appropriations bill. It was completely bipartisan within the budget caps. So why is it being blocked? I was proud to vote for it. I'd vote for it again tomorrow. And I just wish we'd get it done for you and our men and women in uniform. Um, I wanted to shift gears here and ask about Iran. And General Dumford, uh, does Iran continue to be one of the lead sponsors of terrorism around the world? Uh, they are, Senator. I, I described their major export as malign influence. And are they continuing to test ballistic missiles that is quite troubling to both us and our allies, um, and I think in violation of uh, UN resolutions? They are, Senator, as well as provocative behavior in the Gulf. Exactly, that our, our military has encountered in the Gulf just recently. That, that's right, Senator. So one of the things um, that I wanted to ask about is recently we learned that the $1.7 billion in cash relief um, has actually gone, uh, that the administration has provided Iran, has actually gone directly uh, to the Revolutionary Guard Corps. I don't know if you were aware of that. And in fact, the Iranian parliament or their equivalent of our, their legislative body passed a law that essentially said if there was a settlement, a legal settle settlement from a foreign country, which is how this $1.7 billion has been characterized, it would go directly to the military. Does that trouble you that they're taking the proceeds that we're giving them and funding their military? Senator, I wasn't aware of it. It doesn't surprise me that the Republican Guard would have a high priority for funding in, inside of Iran, but it, it certainly is troubling. The more funds that they have available, obviously, uh, the more effective they'll be in spreading malign influence. So, um, you know, one of the things as I look at this, this is our, you know, this relief that we're giving them. They're testing ballistic missiles. They, uh, the money that they're getting us isn't going to the Iranian people. It's going to their revolutionary uh, guard corps that we know promotes terrorism and undermines stability around the world. And, and yet, as I see this situation, I don't see, um, I don't see us taking any steps that we should in terms of being aggressive in coming back, especially on the ballistic missile program and their terrorism issues. So what should we be doing, General? 
Senator, there's, there's two things that I, that I draw your attention to. First is our posture in the Central Command, which is, in fact, there uh, both to deter Iran but also to respond to Iran should a response be required. Also, in the FY17 budget, and I expect you'll see similar requests in the FY18 budget, uh, much of what we are focused on is dealing with what we describe as anti-access area denial. That's Iran's desire to keep us from moving into that area and then operating freely within that area. In many of the programs, from a cyber perspective, from ballistic missile defense capability, strike capability, are all designed to deal with the threat of Iran in the region. So let me just ask you, um, they're still testing ballistic missiles. Uh, would, would you agree that's a, a grave threat? Uh, and something that needs to be addressed in terms of our security. And this is all post-agreement that they're doing this. Agreed? Absolutely, Senator. And that's why we've identified them as one of the four state challenges that we benchmark our joint capabilities against. One of the things I wanted to ask your thoughts on, General, um, is that we've learned about this $400 million in cash that Iran got that would be included in the $1.7 billion that I referenced uh, for release of the American hostages. And did you think that was a good idea? Were you consulted about that? Senator, that would, in the normal course of events, not be something that would be in my lane, so I, I was not consulted. Well, do you think it's a good idea that we should exchange uh, cash to a country like Iran that you've already confirmed is one of the largest state sponsors of terrorism in exchange for hostages? Because as I look at this situation, they've now taken at least three more American hostages. Senator, I, I just don't know the details of the agreement that was made with Iran and what the nature of that money was. I, on, on principle, I would prefer that we not provide additional resources to Iran. So on principle, um, you'd rather them not have more money. And I mean, doesn't it worry you that as we think about exchanging cash with a country like Iran, um, obviously it was funneled through the European countries and uh, that in fact we're going to encourage more bad behavior from Iran and we've seen some of it? Isn't that something we should be concerned about? Uh, Senator, before whatever arrangement was made and after whatever arrangement was made, I'm under no illusion of what Iran is, is intending to do, nor, uh, are we, not, nor are we, we are mindful of the capabilities that they're developing as well. Well, I hope, um, you know, I've introduced sanctions legislation on, to address their ballistic missile program. Uh, I think this ransom payment issue is, is just deeply troubling and it's just causing further bad behavior from Iran. We know they've taken further hostages and I, and I, I, I just hope that this administration uh, will step up and finally address Iran's bad behavior. On behalf of Jeremy Kane, Senator Ernst, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today um, and joining in the discussion. I'd like to start with just a few quick yes or no questions. Very brief, please, gentlemen. Uh, for Secretary Carter, uh, did you know that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, and Ramzi Youssef, who masterminded and planned the 1993 World Trade Center attacks, utilized the Philippines as a safe haven for their planning and training? Yes or no? Uh, I, Senator Ernst, I'll, I'll just say to be, I'll try to answer your questions, yes or no. It depends on whether they lend themselves to that. Uh, and in this case, no, I was not aware. Okay. Uh, yes, he did use it as a safe haven <clears throat> during that planning and training. Uh, General Dunford, did you know that Operation Enduring Freedom covered the Philippines in order to train and assist those local forces in the Philippines against Al-Qaeda-linked terrorist organizations? Uh, yes, I did, Senator. Okay, thank you, General. And for both of you, are you both aware that ISIS released a video this year encouraging fighters that can't get into Syria to head to the Philippines? Uh, I am, yes. I am as well, and I was in Manila last week, Senator. Wonderful. Thank you, General. Um, just like we're witnessing in the Middle East, and we've heard much of the discussion today focus on the Middle East. General, I appreciate you've spent time in Africa as well, um, dealing with Islamic extremist groups. Um, they are also in Southeast Asia, and we are not spending much time talking about that. Um, groups like Abu Sayyaf, they're now bonding together beneath the flag of ISIS. Yet we really, like I said, don't seem to be focusing on this. The Philippine forces lost 44 
of their special police in a single battle to these terrorist groups last year. 15 soldiers were killed in a single battle just last month. Um, it's clear that this is a very real threat. And President Obama admitted that we have underestimated the rise of ISIS in the Middle East. And what I fear right now is that we are completely underestimating the rise of ISIS in Southeast Asia. Uh, so before the president went to Asia last month, I did send a letter to him and encouraged him to uh, visit about how we can counter terrorism and counter ISIS in that region. And I did urge him to bring up this, this issue with the president. And shortly after that, ISIS claimed another attack killing 14 civilians. Uh, Secretary Carter, are you concerned with what we see as a rise of ISIS in Southeast Asia? Uh, I am, and uh, I'll say something, and then I want to uh, uh, ask the chairman also if he'd, he'd chime in. Uh, when I talked about the metastasis of the cancer of ISIL, um, you're absolutely right that Southeast Asia clearly is a place they aspire to spreading. I talked to our counterparts there who were concerned about it. We work with them just next week. I'm, I'll be convening them in Honolulu. Uh, on a number of issues of Pacific security, but one of them is going to be counterterrorism and countering ISIL. I'd say Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, you mentioned the Philippines, uh, and, and other places, but those four come to mind. I've spoken to the defense ministers in each of those four countries. Uh, they have concerns, particularly about the possibility that ISIS could establish a foothold there. Mm -hmm. In some places, it's already... Uh, troubled in some way, and there are places in all those countries, and it could grab hold there. Um, Absolutely. So it is a very much on our agenda. Chairman, please. Senator, I agree with your assessment and concerns. Uh, last week, I met with 29 chiefs of defense in the Pacific in Manila, hosted by the chief of defense of the Philippine Armed Forces, and we discussed broadly the threat of extremism in Asia and what we need to do to deal with it. To your point, uh, there's a thousand foreign fighters alone, we estimate, have come from Indonesia into Syria and Iraq. There are hundreds that came from the Philippines. Other countries uh, as well are dealing with that issue. I think although it's not very visible, there is a significant amount of activity going on to build a, build a capacity of our partners in the Pacific. We're trying to work with them to develop a framework within which they can share information, share intelligence. Uh, we have a significant maritime domain awareness initiative which will help them understand the movement into the sea. We see, for example, significant cooperation between the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia, and the Sulu Sea associated with the movement of people and so forth uh, so, you know, in, as part of this violent extremist problem. So it is a different fight. I call it a requirement for a regional approach in, the, in Southeast Asia as opposed to a coalition, which is required in, in Syria and Iraq. But, but we are absolutely uh, putting pressure on ISIL in Southeast Asia. We are absolutely working very closely with our partners. And frankly, uh, the limit of the support we provide is, is often what they are willing to accept politically. And so we're very keen, and we will bring to the president any requests for support. And I think, as you know, Senator, we are providing some support now to the Philippines, uh, intelligence support and Absolutely. other support to help them to deal with the extremist problem that they have in the South. Thank you, General. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I just really want us to, to ensure that we are not taking our eyes off of that region. We seem to focus very heavily, as we should, on the Middle East and Africa, but we do have other footholds for ISIS. We do have five new bases going into the Philippines, and I think it's important that we really focus on these counter ISIS um, opportunities. So thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On behalf of the chairman, uh, let me recognize Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Secretary Carter and General Dunford. Uh, for being here today and for your service to the country. Um, General Dunford, at one point before this committee, you indicated that you believe Russia poses the greatest threat to the United States. Do you still feel that way? And, and if so, can you identify where you think those threats are most concerning? Senator, I can. Thank you. And, and, and I raised that issue. I was asked before the committee uh, what did I think the most significant challenge for the United States was? And, and of course, we talk about all four uh, state challenges and one violent extremist. But when I look at Russia's nuclear capability, when I look at their cyber capability, when I look at the developments in undersea warfare, 
when I look at their patterns of operation, how often they're operating, the locations they're operating, it's a pattern of operations that we haven't seen in over 20 years. Uh, when I look at uh, Mr. Putin's activities in the Ukraine, in Crimea, in Georgia, that causes me to say that a combination of their behavior as well as their military capability, again, in some high-end areas, uh, would, would cause me to believe that they pose the most significant challenge, uh, potentially the most significant threat to our national interests. Well, thank you. I, I very much appreciate, Secretary Carter, you're raising the European Reassurance Initiative as one of the programs that's threatened if we can't get agreement in Congress on funding um, and share that concern, um, especially because of the potential threat that Russia poses on, um, in Eastern Europe. One of the things that Secretary Kerry said yesterday was that we should consider grounding all military aircraft in key areas of Syria um, in response to what appears to be a blatant Russian uh, bombing of the humanitarian aid that was scheduled to go into Syria. And um, they have denied, of course, but I think as we've seen in the past, we can't really believe what they say. So I would ask you, Secretary Carter, do you agree that that is one avenue that we could take? And what would be the follow-up position if, if they continued to fly um, aircraft? Well, I, I can't speak for Secretary uh, uh, Kerry. He is trying to get on the, for, for the Syrian and Russian Air Force exactly that a cessation of hostilities, and a, which, which means a grounding of their aircraft and not continuing to use them, uh, particularly in a clumsy way, it's a nice word, uh, in the Syrian civil war. There's no question, can be no question of grounding U.S. aircraft that are conducting strikes against ISIL. We do that, uh, we do that with ex exceptional precision uh, and care and concern for civilian casualties that no other country uh, can match. And that's true of our whole coalition and all the strikes we, we conduct. So they're not in the same category at all. And, and uh, we need to continue with our air campaign to defeat ISIL. Let me ask the chair if you want to say anything to add. Senator, the, the most significant concern I would have, and I don't know uh, what, the, what the proposal is, but I would not, first of all, there's no reason to ground our aircraft. We're not barrel bombing civilians. We're not, we're not causing collateral damage. And we have momentum, as we've all discussed here earlier today, against ISIL right now. And I think what the Secretary is saying, I fully associate myself with, we need to keep the pressure on ISIL. Uh, the number one priority that we have is, is disrupting their ability to plan and conduct external operations from Syria. And the cost of taking pressure off of ISIL right now exposes us to risk that I think is not acceptable. In the absence of some other action that we take um, along with our allies in that area, do you see anything changing the dynamic of the civil war in Syria? I, I mean, I. I believe it's going to take some other outside, some other intervention in order to change the direction of this war. And right now, um, there's nothing happening that would do that. I, either one of you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh, the direction in which Secretary Kerry is trying to get the Russians to move uh, which I understand fully, is the direction they always should have been in Syria, which is towards putting an end to the civil war, not th pouring gasoline on it, and not uh, emboldening Assad to be intransigent, but, let but alone conducting uh, an air campaign which is, doesn't adhere to the standards that ours does. Uh, but I'm, so. I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Secretary, but I, I guess... I appreciate what you're saying, and that that should have been Russia's position all along. That's what clearly, Secretary Kerry's trying to get them to. Right, but we have had no success after five years of civil war, and so what I'm asking is, what other options do we have that might change the trajectory of what's happening in Syria? 
Well, I'm, I, I, again, I'm not going to try to, to uh, get in the middle of these negotiations, but I think that Secretary Kerry is trying to find uh, a, a, a way to achieve those objectives. They're, they're, those are the right objectives to have, and I, um, but as we sit here today, the Russians do not, and the Syrians do not seem to be moving in that direction, as he said yesterday. Chairman, you want to add anything? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, I uh, share your regret about the department starting the fiscal year with another continuing resolution. Uh, I also regret that the Democrats have filibustered the defense appropriations bills three times. Do you share my regret over that fact? I, I can't speak to the internal deliberations of the, the Congress. The, well, the well that's a I'd public say, vote. That's not an internal Well, let me just say, we, we, we know that the only way to get budget stability <clears throat> is with everybody coming together. And I see proposals from this side and that side and this committee and that committee, and they're all different. We submitted a budget in accordance with the bipartisan budget agreements just months after a two-year bipartisan budget agreement was agreed. That's what we did. And that is, in my judgment, the only way we can get through stability. So I'm tr I, I am uh, continuing to uh, support the position of the bipartisan budget agreement. And, and anything that comes out of the Congress that is supported, uh, uh, an appropriation at last for FY17 would be good for the Department of Defense. And I hope we get such a thing you, in November. But the reality is that these things have to be supported by both parties, both houses, and signed by the president. I'm the Secretary of Defense. I can't make all that happen. But I know that's what has to happen in order for us to get an appropriation. Eight years in a row straight, that okay, hasn't I, happened. Okay, I understand. My time is limited here. Do you believe if a bill is passed out of the House of Representatives that has a larger increase for defense spending than it does for non-defense discretionary spending that the President should sign that legislation? Uh, I can't speak for the... Mr. Secretary, you I'm are the Secretary you, of well, Defense. You asked the question... You're not the Director of the National Endowment of the Arts. You're not the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. You're the Secretary where of I was Defense. Headed. That's exactly where I was headed. I'm not. Uh, and therefore, I can't speak for the needs of those departments. I do know that some of the national security-related departments, which are outside of the defense appropriations, you, you that, which I am that familiar, here and need in their well, funding not. as well. So it's not a matter of indifference to me whether the government as a whole is funded, and it's certainly not a matter of indifference to me whether an appropriation that can be supported by everyone up here so that it passes and passed by the president uh, is done or not. That's what I have to be for, because I'm for getting a budget and for budget stability. And I, I just observe, I'm not a participant, I'm an observer, that the only way that happens is not with this proposal and that proposal, it's with a bipartisan budget agreement. That's the line we tried to hew to. We're just playing it as straight I, as we can. I understand. You were the Deputy Secretary of Defense for Secretary Panetta, is that correct? Yes. I'm on page 374 of his memoirs, he states, in fact, as my efforts to fight the sequester began to get some attention, a few congressional Democrats urged me to emphasize the danger of cuts to domestic programs, not just defense. To my amazement, the rest of the cabinet, including members responsible for those parts of the budget, largely stayed out of the debate. That left me to argue for all of us, which I tried to do, even when I found myself frustratingly alone. Have congressional Democrats urged you to advocate for increased de de domestic spending in addition to defense spending? Uh, well, first of all, I, I, I should say, uh, you know, f few had the experience with bipartisan budget management than Secretary Panetta. I don't remember that passage of his, his memoirs, but that sounds, uh, sounds like his, do you remember his voice. Do you remember but his I have not found myself in the same circumstance, except I am in the same circumstance he was, namely, and I guess that was 2013, facing the prospect of sequester. Uh, and he didn't like it, and I didn't like it, and I don't think any Secretary of Defense liked it, and I think it's awfully unfair to our troops to do this again and again and again and again. And that's what we've been warning about, that's what I have been, that's what our chiefs did last week, and I'm just hoping that when everybody comes back in November, Congress reconvenes that we get an appropriation that everybody can stand behind um, 
and um, uh, that mo moves the country forward. General Dunford, are we in great power competition with China? Uh, we are, Senator. Secretary Carter, are we in great power competition with China? We are absolutely right. Thank you. Um, one final question. Uh, are you engaged in any planning, deliberations, internal consultations of any kind to transfer control of the detention uh, facility at Guantanamo Bay to the Department of Justice? No, I'm not. Thank you. I'm going to take a deep breath. Um, I'm, I'm always proud to serve on this committee because it's an oasis of bipartisanship in the Senate. And I hope we keep our eye firmly on our ability to lead in a bipartisan way to get the funding for our military that we really need, uh, including being honest about budgeting, not putting base budget items in OCO so that we can pretend that we're not spending money because OCO is off the budget books. Uh, I think that the chairman has done a remarkable job to try to keep us in an honest place as it relates to budgeting. I respect him for his effort in that regard. And I know I speak for many on our side of the aisle, including I hope I know the ranking member, that we're going to continue to try to work as hard as we can in a bipartisan way uh, to get your budget done and make sure we're not trying to come back in six months and fund the war effort because we've played budget games at the 11th hour with OCO. My question today, um, we've got 1.3 in the FY17 budget for train and equip for local opposition forces and for the Iraqi security forces. Um, I'd like some kind of brief update, if I could, on the screening process. Um, how are we determining who, I mean, one of our challenges has always been in Syria. Who do we, who do we help, and are they really the good guys? Um, and obviously, we had one massive failed attempt to try to put together a force on the ground through train and equip, and now I know we've gone back, and I was in Jordan and visited with our leaders over there about the effort that's ongoing, working with smaller groups and testing them first and making sure they're doing the right thing. But if you could briefly talk about how we are doing the screening process uh, for those resources, I'd appreciate it. Sure, Senator. I'll, I'll start. Uh, and, and thank you. And, and basically, it is as you say. Namely, uh, we have the same vetting process going on. And I'll ask the chairman to describe that. But the, the, the train and equip program that was a disappointment when it started uh, is now we have a, a changed completely our approach to it. And it is as you described, namely not trying to create de novo uh, forces that will go in and oppose uh, ISIL, but identifying forces that are and then enabling them. And that has been successful. Uh, we're going to continue to do that. It does involve vetting to our, our standards, which is required uh, of us, but the program has changed. Uh, it needed to change. It did change uh, and is now on a much more successful footing. I should also thank the committee uh, in the spirit of what you said earlier about budgeting for, for their budgetary support uh, in a timely way to our requests. Uh, for, for that and much appreciate that as well. And if I had asked the chairman also. Senator, just some of the mechanics. Uh, first, individuals who we are working with are vouched for by their tribal leadership. We do biometrics. We do a detailed interview process. We watch closely their behaviors. I, I would say our leaders over the last several years have been very, very good at uh, at uh, literally separating wheat from the chaff as we go through the process of growing uh, Syrian opposition, Syrian or, as the case may be, uh, forces in Iraq, uh, tribal forces in Iraq. So the vetting process, I think, is, is fairly sophisticated. And again, it's, it's, it's built on 15 years of lessons learned right now, a combination of the technology that we have available with biometrics, but also uh, some intangibles that in, include, again, tribal leadership, behavior identification, those kinds of things. Um, and, and I also wanted to, um, to both of you, I appreciate your continued commitment in the area of uh, sexual assault. I know we have put a lot on the military. I think we have counted up literally there are hundreds of changes we have made over the last few years to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I did want to hone in on one area because as we looked at all of the reports in the last year, lots of good news 
uh, incidents down, reporting up, but that retaliation thing is an issue. And um, you issued a report in April which highlighted standardizing the definition of retaliation, which is tough because, you know, sometimes it's in the eye of the person who's being retaliated upon. And getting a standard definition, I think, is really important. Uh, we put in this year's NDAA a provision to make retaliation its own offense. I wanted to find out what kind of progress are you making on trying to come up with a standardized definition of retaliation in this context. Th thanks very much, Senator. Let me just uh, begin by, say by thanking you and all the members of this committee for bearing down on this problem. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really proud of the way our forces conduct themselves, uh, but there are, always, there, there are people uh, who don't conduct themselves up to that standard, and we, we can't have it. It's, it's objectionable anywhere in society, but in the profession of arms, it's particularly uh, objectionable, and so I very much appreciate your efforts. You're right. Retaliation is something that... Uh, uh, we have begun to realize is a dimension of this uh, problem that was underattended. We had, had, had done good work, I think, at, at, at the law enforcement part, attending to victims, and at prevention. Retaliation, the reason why definitionally it's, it's complicated, but we'll get there, is that there are a number of different ways that retaliation takes place, some of them quite subtle but serious. So uh, one is, you know, a superior who, who, who holds it against somebody that they reported a sexual right. uh, assault, which is promote. completely unfair. A little, a, a little more indirect is people who are getting taunted social via social media mm -hmm. and so forth. So we need to define these in such a way that they're legally appropriate, which you would understand, but that also cover the full gamut of things that a, a common sense definition of retaliation would include. So we are working towards that, and, and, and it is complicated, but we'll get there. And, I and how soon do you think you'll get there? Your, your effort. Uh, I uh, believe that the uh, 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 update on that is due by the end of the year of this year. I did the report that I submitted uh, to you was earlier in this year, uh, and we should be able to get that done. And of course, we'll uh, communicate that to the committee and get your views. But I appreciate your sticking with us on this out, on this issue. Thank you both. Secretary, I'd, I'd just like to point out that if it were not for the work of the women on this committee, in a bipartisan basis, we would not have achieved the results that we have. And I am deeply appreciative for the bipartisan effort that's gone on and continues to go on in this committee to address an issue that you know is still with us, at, maybe to a lesser degree, but is still with us. Senator Tillis. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, Secretary Carter, I want to go back to the, the comments that Senator Ayotte made about, I was someone else who supported the bipartisan budget agreement. Uh, very disappointed that on three different occasions the uh, defense appropriations bill has been filibustered. What it, not talking about any other discussions about appropriations. You're familiar with our defense appropriations bill, right? The one that's been filibustered on three different occasions. Do each of you think that passing that bill would be helpful with respect to completing your mission within your lanes? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to go back to where I started, which is there's no particular bill. I, I, I'm aware of three or four are, different Are you familiar versions. with the measure that we've tried to get on me, in the chamber on three different occasions? I'm, I'm aware of filibuster. several different measures, both in the Senate and the House. So, uh, and Secretary Carter, the, this is a specific thing that we're trying to get on in the chamber of the Senate. Are you familiar with the bill that passed out of appropriations, the defense appropriations bill that we've tried to get on in the chamber? I am a, I'm aware of the one that came before, yes. Okay. And Are you, uh, is anyone on your staff familiar with an appropriations bill that we're trying to get on in the Senate chamber? I'm sure they are. Okay, and what would they generally say about the passage of that bill with respect to you being able to complete your mission in your lane? Not talking about any of the other appropriations. I think bills. what they'd say is that if the Senate and the House pass an appropriations bill that comports, that the president can sign 
we will get an appropriations bill. I fully hope let me, uh, we get let me go exactly to General that. General Dunford, after are you the familiar in November with the when defense appropriations bill that's been filibustered on three different occasions? Senator, I'm not familiar with the details. Mm -hmm. Do you know generally from your service chiefs or anyone else that they think it would be helpful to pass that bill? Have you, have you received any feedback on this? This is a specific measure. This isn't a, a concept. This is something that's gone through the appropriations process. It's something that we want to pass that gives you certainty um, that's within the constraints of the bipartisan uh, budget agreement. Uh, Senator, just, we gonna... do not ask the uniform military for their opinion on issues that are political in nature. Fair enough. Let me go to something else. Well, it, it just seems odd to me that, that we can't get a straight answer on something, at least on the political side, Mr. Chair, I understand that, uh, from the Secretary on something that's specific to helping provide the certainty that we want to provide the Department. I want to ask you to go a completely different direction. And uh, General Dunford, maybe I'll ask you, you know, back in uh, January we had Iranians fire missiles within about 1,500 uh, yards of the uh, Harry S. Truman later. In the same month, we had patrol boats uh, captured. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Article 2 of the Code of Conduct for members of the Armed Forces. Uh, do you think the, the commander who surrendered met the dictates of the Code of uh, Conduct under Article 2, or were there other mitigating factors that prevented him from doing that? Uh, Senator, I believe that's being adjudicated right now uh, in accordance with the UCMJ, so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment publicly. But the fact that it's going through the UCMJ obviously, uh, I think, answers your question. Uh, another, another subject. This has to do with ISIL. You said that we need to keep the pressure on ISIL, and I know that that was being answered in the context of Syria and probably Iraq. But do you feel like we have adequately addressed putting, uh, keeping pressure on ISIL globally when you talk about Libya, you talk about Egypt and other areas where they seem to be, and, and uh, 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 Senator Ernst talked about the Philippines. Do you feel like that we have an adequate global strategy for keeping pressure on ISIL? Senator, I want to assure you that we have a military strategy to deal with ISIL globally, and we look very carefully at ISIL wherever they are. Uh, we have ongoing, and we don't have an opportunity often to talk about it, but we have ongoing operations in West Africa. We have ongoing operations in Libya. We have ongoing operations in East Africa. Of course, the Syrian Iraq, we've spoken much about that today. We have ongoing operations in Afghanistan, and we're involved in a wide range of capacity building exercises uh, and, and uh, initiatives in Southeast Asia. We're also working, and, and uh, I just spent this weekend with uh, a large group of, of my counterparts uh, to look at counter ISIL. I'll have almost 50 chiefs of defense here in October uh, to discuss this. This is, in fact, what you're suggesting, a trans-regional problem that will require a global response. One of the key drivers of our success will be a broader intelligence and information framework within which we can harness all of these other nations who have information that would be helpful to us. But am I satisfied or complacent with where we are? No. Do I believe we have a strategic framework within which to deal with ISIL trans-regionally? Yes. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for your public service. Would either one of you uh, like to characterize uh, the resurgence of the Taliban in Afghanistan? Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start. Uh, the, uh, it is the fighting season in Afghanistan. Uh, the Afghan security forces uh, have done well this season. The Taliban has been strong, uh, but the Afghan security forces are much stronger this year than they were last year. They continue to gather strength. Uh, General Nicholson's doing a great job of helping them with that. We made some decisions, the President made some decisions, uh, which gave uh, General Nicholson some wider scope uh, to uh, uh, advise, assist, and so forth. The Afghan security forces, the President made a decision to adjust upward our presence there uh, next year. We're continuing to go forward with the aviation and other enablers for the Afghan security forces. So the process, which has been under some year, under, underway some, for some years, to try to build the Afghan security forces to, the, to a point where they can maintain 
uh, the security of their country in Afghanistan doesn't become again a place from which terrorism arises in the United States. That is our program. That is what we've been trying to accomplish. I, I, want, I should turn it because we, uh, that progress we owe in very important measure to General Dunford when he was the commander there, and he knows that very well, so let me ask him to join in. Senator, there's no doubt that the, that the uh, Afghan uh, National Security Forces have had some challenges uh, over the past 18 months when they've been in the lead and we have gone to a train and advise assist mission. Uh, our assessment is that they continue to control about 70 percent of the country. Uh, they're taking far more casualties than we're comfortable with, and they still have capability gaps in their special operations capability, their aviation enterprise, their intelligence, logistics, and, of course, broadly at the Minister of Defense, Minister of Interior level. And that's our focus right now is to further develop those capabilities so we can mitigate the casualties that they're suffering, which is of great concern, as well as some of the tactical setbacks that they've had. But on balance, uh, I would call what's going on right now between the Afghan National Defense Security Forces uh, and the Taliban as, uh, as roughly a stalemate. Uh, the Taliban have not been successful in, in, in achieving the goals that were outlined in their campaign plan, which they typically make public in the spring of each year. And on balance, the Afghan forces are holding. In my judgment, if we commit to continue to support the Afghan forces and continue to grow their capability, they will be able to provide security in Afghanistan. And as Secretary Carter said, as importantly, we'll be able to maintain an effective counterterrorism presence and platform in South Asia in conjunction with our Afghan partners. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to both of you for all you do to keep us safe and to keep our country free. Your service and sacrifice are deeply appreciated. Late last week, there was a video that surfaced, um, a video that appeared to show the Free Syrian Army, um, uh, personnel from the Free Syrian Army, threatening and insulting American service members uh, and, and forcing them to leave the town of al Rai where they had been providing assistance uh, to the FSA. Analysts who have studied the video believe the incident occurred because the U.S. is also supporting Kurdish forces in Syria. Um, uh, Secretary Carter, first, have, have you seen this video, and, and can you confirm reports that it, it appears to have taken place in al Rai? I've not seen the video. I've read reports about it. Let me ask Chairman Dunford, who has followed that closely, to answer you. Senator, it took place uh, in northern Syria. Uh, I'm familiar with it. I didn't watch the, d watch the video. I have spoken to our commanders about it. What I can assure you is that, that uh, the group that was um, uh, taking, taking some action against our forces, at least verbally, was a very small minority of the forces we're supporting. And that incident was policed up by our other partners. And, uh, and we view that to be an isolated incident and not reflective of the relationship that our forces have with the vetted Syrian opposition forces. In fact, I think the progress along the northern border between Syria and Turkey is indicative of the relationship we have, which is very effective. Okay, so I, I think that goes a certain distance toward answering what was uh, my next question, which was, um, you know, what's the level of tension that you're seeing between some of the Sunni Arab uh, rebel groups that were assisting on the one hand and, and on the other hand the uh, the Kurdish groups that were also supporting in Syria and and, and is that is there tension there and, and could that t tension uh, and the resentment that it engenders possibly threaten the security of our, our U.S. personnel? Senator, there's incredible tension in that region and I, and I would offer it to you. I think it's a testimony to the professionalism of our forces that are there because they have actually been managing this tension for months and months. And the fact that we've been able to continue to support the Syrian Democratic Forces and have them make the significant progress they made and continue to support the vetted Syrian opposition forces while we politically manage the relationship between Turkey and the Syrian Democratic Forces and the United States. Is all, it's, it is all part of a pretty complicated situation on the ground over there that we are managing on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not dismissive of the challenges, but, but frankly, to date, we have been able to mitigate them. Okay. Thank you. Um, yesterday, as I'm sure you're both aware, uh, the Senate debated a resolution of disapproval related to the sale uh, of U.S. weapons to Saudi Arabia, and uh, uh, there was some discussion of our, our broader support of Saudi Arabia's uh, intervention in Yemen. 
This is a headline from November 2014. Houthis gain ground against Yemen's al Qaeda, say they will continue their fight until al Qaeda is defeated in their strongholds. Secretary Carter, you stated on April 8, 2015, regarding uh, new gains being made by al Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula. Um, uh, quote, AQAP is a group that we're very concerned with as the United States because in addition to having other regional ambitions and ambitions within Yemen, we all know that AQAP has the ambition to strike Western targets, including the United States, close quote. Um, now, your quote was made, I believe, roughly one month uh, after the U.S. supported intervention against the Houthi rebels who four months before had been pushing back against AQAP uh, before that became, uh, began in earnest. Now, I understand the complexity of the conflict in Yemen, and I, I completely appreciate the fact that there are no easy answers uh, uh, when it comes to that conflict in Yemen. But, uh, Mr. Secretary, do, do you do, uh, do AQAP and other Sunni extremist groups operating in Yemen um, still pose the greater threat to U.S. security? I absolutely stand by what I said. We continue to watch very closely AQAP and to take action where we where we need to to protect ourselves. No question about it. Okay. And does does our support of the fight against the Houthis, who are also AQAP's enemy, uh, does that uh, threaten potentially, however inadvertently, to strengthen or uh, take the focus off of of AQAP or or, or ISIS? We, we've not taken our focus off of AQAP, no. Uh, General Dunford, you look like you wanted to add something. No, I just I, I, I fully agree with the Secretary on that. We, we are singularly focused on AQAP, and, uh, and we have the resources dedicated to AQAP that we think are appropriate. Okay. I see my time's expired. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, are the Houthis sponsored by the Iranians? Uh, they are certainly assisted in some respects by the Iranians, uh, Chairman, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, would you like me to proceed? Thank you. Mr. Secretary General, I want to get your input on something I asked each of the service chiefs about last week. In the FY15 NDAA, we passed a requirement from the Jacob Sexton Act for every service member to receive a robust mental health assessment every year. Can you give me an update on where the Department is with implementation of the Sexton Act requirement on mental health assessments? Mr. Secretary General? Uh, I, I'll need to get back to you specifically on the, uh, that assessment. I would like to say something more generally about men uh, mental health and That's fine. priority, if I may, uh, uh, Senator, I appreciate your, uh, your interest in it. Uh, as it happens, it is um, uh, Suicide Prevention Month this month, and I only mention that because uh, we do uh, – uh, uh, have uh, suicide in our services, and we do believe that suicide is preventable. That's what the doctors tell us. All the spe specialists tell us this is something that is pre preventable, and therefore it belongs in the family of things that we do to take care of our troops and ensure their, their welfare. We're spending more, um, and I can get you the numbers on that, but I, we, we, we have, uh, over the last few years, uh, increased several fold our spending on mental health treatment specifically aimed at suicide um, and uh, trying to remove the stigma uh, associated with seeking mental uh, health care, uh, and also emphasizing the need for other service members to watch out for one another, because one of the things we know is there's usually somebody who spotted the behavior that looks, that can lead to suicide, right. self-isolation, uh, uh, depression, uh, odd things on social media, uh, and so forth. So we're trying to tell everybody to watch out for their fellow uh, service members. 
<laughs> Senator, I know uh, each of the services has the tools. Uh, I don't know in application what the percentage is of the force that has received the evaluation yet, but we can certainly get that. That's largely a, a service chief responsibility, not something I pay attention to on a day-to-day -day basis, although, as you know, I've been, I've been very involved in the mental health issues over the last several years. I do. I do. And um, this was signed into law in December 2014. Um, it's about two years now. So uh, do you expect uh, General Dunford to see this fully implemented in the next year? I, I do, Senator. I guess what I was alluding to is the percentage of the force that actually has it right now. Cause no, I, I understand that, yeah. Right. So, I, you know, my, and I'll and I know it takes time to ramp up. I was just wondering right. if you think 2017 is the year that that this can get fully implemented. I, I think that's based on my previous experience as a service chief. I think that's a realistic timeline. Okay. Mr. Secretary. I absolutely concur. We'll, we'll meet that timeline. Uh, to both of you, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about broader counterterrorism strategy. Um, in four months, we're going to have a new commander in chief and preventing the next attack on our homeland and addressing the persistent conflict and instability in the Middle East is going to be one of the most pressing and complex challenges. Um, how would you advise this concern about our counterterrorism strategy? And, uh, you know, how would you inform uh, that next commander in chief as to um, how to move forward at this time? Obviously, there's a number of areas, but, but looking forward, how would you uh, talk to them about our counterterrorism strategy as we head, as we head into a new uh, administration? I'll start and then, then turn it over to the to, to the, the the chairman. Um, uh, uh, we need to uh, continue to press on all fronts. We can't let up. Uh, whether it's in 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 the counter ISIL campaign in Syria and Iraq, elsewhere, or here at home, uh, AQAP was mentioned a moment ago. That's a serious one. Um, and so our capabilities, not our, our military capabilities, our law enforcement capabilities, our homeland security capabilities, uh, all of this, okay. uh, which we've honed now uh, in the years since 2001, uh, uh, this is not going to go away. Uh, this phenomenon of we'll defeat ISIL, but there will be terrorism in our country's future. And if, so if I could ask you another be part question, of the national security landscape. I apologize, I'm running Good out chairman. of time here. Um, and you may have answered this earlier. Uh, I had to come in and go out. But Raqqa, um, when do you, or, or and, and not obviously a, a single date, but how is this moving forward? Are we cutting off? I, I know closing Manbij has cut off a significant amount of the flow. Um, where do things stand in Raqqa? Are we moving forward on that? Do you see progress every day? And, and what are you looking at as a time when Raqqa is liberated? Uh, I do see progress. We're working uh, in that part of Syria uh, with the Syrian Democratic Forces. Uh, they're the group with which we worked in, as you indicated, successfully in uh, Manbij, and they and others associated uh, with them will be the force that envelops and collapses ISIL's control over Raqqa. Uh, at the same time, I, I emphasize, and the chairman already uh, stressed this, we're working with the Turks also, the Turkish uh, military, our good ally, very strongly, uh, also in, in northwest, uh, in the northwestern part uh, portion there. And um, obviously they have difficulties with one another, but in each case we support them against our common and, objective, and which Mr. is counter ISIL. Mr. Chairman, chairman, if you give me just 15 seconds. Um, on behalf of um, everyone in Indiana and the family and, and others, too, um, when we go to Raqqa, we lost some young men and women there uh, who were killed by ISIL, and we want to have them come home. We don't want to leave anyone behind, and we would ask for your cooperation and assistance. Um, uh, my young man, Peter Kassig, um, Kayla Mueller, so many others, um, not to leave any names out, um, but all the parents and all the, all the folks back home, we want them all to come home, and we'd sure appreciate your assistance in making that happen. Noted, Senator. Thank, thank you. you. I thank you, Senator, for bringing that issue up. They should come home. Senator Graham. Well, thank you. Thank you both for your uh, service to the country. We're going to try to get through as much as possible here. Do you support the arms sale uh, 
to uh, Saudi Arabia that's being proposed? Uh, I do, yes. Do you, General? I do, Senator. Okay. Uh, JASTA, are you concerned that we could be creating an environment where <clears throat> something like this bill could be used against our troops down the road? Uh, it, that is, it, that law, that is a, a law enforcement matter, but we are watching it closely for the very reason. Do you support the president's namely, veto of this? Well, bill? I'm very, con I'm concerned about. Okay. Uh, I'm Fair concerned enough. about exactly what you're talking okay. about. Fair enough, and we'll talk. Are. I'll write you a letter. We can do it more in detail, but I understand your concerns. Uh, do you support arming the Syrian Kurds? Uh, I do support working, uh, continuing to work with them, yes. Um, I mean, no, I didn't now, say work with them, providing them arms. Yeah, well, we, are, we have provided them with some equipment already and providing them arms, yes. They okay. are, part of, the, they are part of the Syrian Democratic Forces. It, it, right. Now, we haven't taken any specific I decisions well, about that I got yet. You. And, but right. they are... The answer is yes. You support arming the Kurds more uh, in I Syria. support whatever is required okay. to help them okay. move in the direction of rockets. Which could be providing them more arms. Yeah. What about you, General Dunford? Senator, it's important. Uh, I can't answer this yes or no, and it's important I, I say you. a couple of things about this. Number one, they're the most effective force that we have right now and the force that we need to go on Raqqa, and we do have sufficient force to be able to secure and seize Raqqa. Yes, sir, I appreciate that. We, do, they, do they support removal of Assad? Uh, today, that is not their stated political objective. So wait a they minute. Focused. Now, slow down. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have two objectives, to destroy ISIL, right, and to, move, to remove Assad. Is that correct, both of you? Uh, we have a military objective uh, to destroy ISIL. I do not have a military objective to do remove you, Assad. Well, the president has an objective of— uh, He has a political objective okay. to remove Assad. All right. So do you agree with me Assad is winning right now? Uh, I think Assad is clearly in a much stronger place than he was right. a year ago. Well, thank you. You've always been very honest to this committee. Do you agree that uh, Obama will leave office and Assad will still be in power January 2017? I don't see a path right now where Assad would okay. not be in office. In so January. let's talk about how you change the political equation. Do you agree with me that the only way Assad's ever going to leave if there's some military pressure on him that makes the threat militarily more real to him? I think that's a fair statement, Senator. Okay, so if the main fighting force inside of Syria is not signed up to take Assad out, where does that force come from? Senator, I, I can't identify that force, but I, I do want to distinguish between what you're suggesting with Assad and, and Raqqa. The reason why I support the SDF is my number one priority is to, is yeah, to I, stop I, the planning I, and conducting I, of external I, operations. Totally. And moving totally forward good. against Raqqa with the SDF yes, is the sir. way to do that. So let, let's look at this way. Uh, um, ISIL's Germany and Assad's Japan, we're focusing on Germany. So will this force, which is mainly Kurd, but not all, can they liberate Raqqa and hold it? This force is not intended to hold Raqqa, no. What is the plan to hold Raqqa? We, know, we, we currently have 14,000 Arabs uh, that have been identified. and when Is we that the holding force? That may consist of part of the holding force. Well, do we have a plan to hold Raqqa? We have a plan. It is not resourced, okay. Senator. Okay, all right. So I just want everybody to know where we're at in Syria. We're making gains against ISIL, the main force that we're using, are Kurds who can't hold Raqqa. Arabs have to. You're absolutely right about that. The Kurdish force, which is the main center of gravity inside of Syria, at this moment is not interested in putting military pressure on, on Assad. Other than that, we're in a good spot. Now, I'm not blaming y'all. You didn't create this problem. Years ago, most of you recommended we up the Free Syrian Army when it would have mattered. We are where we are. I just want to make sure that the country knows what's going on in Syria is going to be inherited by the next president. And if there's not a change in strategy to create a ground component that not only can hold Raqqa and put military pressure on the side, this war never ends. Uh, Russia, did they bomb this convoy? UN convoy. Senator, we, that hasn't been concluded, but my judgment would be that they did. They're certainly responsible. Do you agree with me, Secretary Carter? And we've been friends for years, and I'm sorry, it's so contentious. I, That's you, all right. You're a good man. What should we do about Russia, who was given notice about this convoy, if they, in fact, bombed a U.N. convoy delivering humanitarian aid? What should we do about that? Well, I... Uh, 
if, let me put it even a little more harshly, uh, and the uh, chairman said this uh, earlier, the Russians are responsible uh, for this strike, whether they conducted it or not, because totally they have agree taken responsibility for the conduct of the Syrians by associating themselves with the Syrian regime. What they're supposed to do, and what Secretary Kerry has been indefatigably pursuing uh, diplomatically, is to uh, uh, get a true cessation of hostilities and get Assad to move aside in a political transition. They're not doing and, their part. And I, 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 that, is, that is what Secretary Kerry is trying to achieve. Is that difficult? Absolutely. Does it look in the last few days like that's the direction it's headed? No. And he said, he said as much, but that's what he's trying to accomplish. Do you think the Russians are being helpful? My time is up. Have they been more? Do you think the Russians bombed this convoy? Most likely. I, I do, Senator. Last question. Is there a plan B in terms of, if diplomacy fails, a plan B for Syria that has a military component? Senator, we have regarding done. Regarding Assad. We, we have done and will continue to do a wide range of planning, and should the President uh, change the policy objectives, we'll be prepared to support those. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for your service. It is appreciated by all of us. Secretary Carter, you stated that the United States will not ignore attempts to interfere with our democratic processes, which I believe is in reference to the recent cyber attacks on political parties, candidates, and election systems. By that, do you mean that costs will be imposed on those responsible for these attacks? Uh, it's, it's, uh, sadly, the reference is, is a very broad one. I made it in Europe uh, and was speaking it to that audience uh, uh, very broadly to include the issue you uh, stated, but which is uh, a concern they all have and we have at NATO. Uh, the broader category is called hybrid warfare. It go, ranges from little green men to people interfering in democratic uh, process. That's a concern that I was discussing with allies when I was uh, over there. But and when, it's part of the way NATO is going to have to adapt to the world as it really is. And yes, we're going to have to defend ourselves uh, against. So costs would be thing. imposed for cyber attacks? That is uh, like any other attack. Do you think that with regards to cyber that this should be done in a public way so that the penalties are clearly visible? Uh, to other potential attackers in the future? Uh, uh, well, I, I certainly think that we need to defend ourselves and then take action against perpetrators uh, when we identify them, and that in an, in, in, is in appropriate ways. I simply mean that because the perpetrators are uh, of cyber uh, attacks range from, and cyber intrusions range from nation states to cutouts to hackers, to criminal Correct. gangs, and it's quite a variety. And it's why our highest priority in cyber, and including in our cyber command, is defense of our own networks. Right. And it it, it has on. been uh, widely reported that Russian hackers are responsible for the penetration that we've seen at the Democratic National Committee, those computer systems. So when we look at leaks of the DNC emails and documents. Um, I guess the questions continue to persist regarding the strength of that connection between the hackers and Russian officials. And it is generally accepted that the affiliation exists. If this is true, that there is this connection out there, what is clear is that it's a to me, another very public instance, uh, and this time using cyber, where Russia continues their aggression towards this country and towards our interests. And when we have an adversary who so brazenly strikes at the heart of our democratic process, I think that indicates how low they believe the cost of that behavior is going to be. So in other words, I think 
I think we've possibly lost uh, the deterrence factor when it comes to cyber attacks. Would you agree with that? Uh, uh, we can't lose uh, deterrence uh, effect ever. And with respect to Russia, uh, it is it, it, one of the reason one of the emphases stresses we made in our budget. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why we would appreciate having our budget passed as is, uh, to get back to an earlier question, uh, is because it prioritizes something we haven't had to do, Senator, as you're stressing, for a quarter of a century, which is, we, we, it used to be, we, we, we haven't had, as a major component of our defense strategy, countering the possibility of Russian aggression. Now we do. Now That's we why do. we're making and investments, and it ranges from cyber to the European Reassurance Initiative, uh, which is um, one of the things that we hope doesn't get affected in the I, budget. And I apologize for interrupting you. The chairman's strict on time. But dealing with, dealing with cyber, when we look at cyber, do you have plans um, that you have given to this administration or um, are plans available to provide the administration with flexibility in dealing with cyber? Uh, specifically, uh, how do we address such attacks, whether they are from a nation state, whether they are from organized crime, or whether they are from individuals? Uh, are there plans out there on how these attacks are going to be addressed, whether through deterrence or actual actions, and are those plans updated as we continue to see uh, the expansion of cyber attacks on this country? Uh, that's a very good question, and we're just discussing here because there are many, uh, many aspects to the answer to this, but yes, we have a lot of cyber capabilities that we are building, developing in all the services, and at Cyber Command, and more generally for the Russians. Uh, let me uh, ask the chairman to uh, add something. Senator, for exactly the reason you're raising, uh, we're in the process of rewriting at the Secretary's direction a more broad framework for dealing with Russia and contingencies associated with Russia. It's also the reason why our national military strategy now will be a classified document because what we're trying to do is provide a strategic framework to deal with the full range of behavior that we may see from a state like Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. And in some cases, a cyber attack may not uh, beget a cyber response. We want to make sure our national command authority has a full range of options to deal with something that has been determined, in fact, a violation of our sovereignty and an attack in cyberspace. So there's really two things. One, the strategic framework we're working on, and then we're also working on a full range of tools, cyber tools, so that we have both the ability to protect our own network and uh, to take the fight to the enemy in cyberspace as required, our offensive cyber capabilities. So I would tell you that the issue that you're outlining really is being addressed in both a strategic framework as well as physical tools that we're developing. But again, it's not just focused on cyber. It's focused on providing the Secretary and the President a full range of options with which to respond in the event of an, atta an attack, again, whether it be cyber or anything else. I thank you for that, and I think the deterrence aspect of, uh, of cyber response is, uh, is very, very important that we keep that and also uh, that public responses um, make an impression as well. Thank you, sir. Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, last week, as you know, we had the service chiefs testify, and uh, I began my comments commending you, Mr. Secretary, and the President for the selection of such uh, men and women of high caliber, high integrity, uh, leading our mil military, including the current chairman. And one of the reasons is that they typically give the, this committee and the American people honest testimony, and an example of that was last week. I asked what the risk level was our nation faced in being able to conduct a full spectrum of operations, including one conventional conflict, and each service chief said that this would entail, quote, high military risk for their service, each service chief, which I found remarkable and distressing. General Dunford, do you know if that's ever happened before where all four service chiefs have stated that we currently exist at a state of high military risk for our forces? General Milley described what that meant, which is 
a lot of death for our military if they have to go into this kind of spectrum of ops. Is this unprecedented? Uh, Senator, I don't, I don't know if it's unprecedented, but over the last several years, uh, I think all of the chiefs, uh, to include me when I was a commandant and the chiefs before, uh, I assume that responsibility have been articulating the risk associated with uh, the readiness challenges that we've had really now that date back as far as 2005. So do you, you agree then, I, I assume, with the assessment of each service chief that uh, we face high military risk in terms of a Senator, Spectrum of ops that includes Senator I, I don't agree that we have, I, I agree that each of the services has high risk and they've articulated it. The one thing I think I, want to, I would like to say and then answer your question is, we today can defend the homeland, we today can meet our alliance responsibilities, and we today have a competitive advantage over any of those four plus one we spoke about. But I fully associate myself with the Chiefs when they talk about the time and the, and the casualties that we would take as a result of readiness shortfalls that we have today. Do you think high military risk is acceptable? I, I, I did not say that, Senator, for one minute. So what I want to do is I want to communicate to those who are listening, both in the force and, and, and our potential adversaries, to make it clear that my judgment is that the U.S. military today can, in fact, dominate any enemy in a conflict. Mr. I Secretary, um, the four service chiefs talked about high military risk. Um, again, I thought that was remarkable. I don't know if that's ever happened, Mr. Chairman, before this committee before, but it begs the question that we've been talking about in this hearing today is how, if, if that's what they're saying, how can we not, how can the president not support increased military spending? Right now there's a new Gallup poll out saying first time since 2002 the American people support more military spending. If the service chiefs are each saying, we face high military risk. How can we not be supportive of additional military spending? I just don't. I I, I just don't understand that at all. Uh, uh, well, first of all, let me uh, uh, thank you and associate myself with your commendation of the senior leadership of our department. We're blessed as a country uh, to ha have such people serving us, and they told it to you straight, and I too associate myself with what they said. There is risk in the force, and the risk- it's Actually the, high the, risk. The, let, me, let me tell you, unpack that, because they each did that for you. Uh, it, there are, uh, it's different in each of the services, but there are a few common denominators. Uh, one has been budget instability, which is why I am and will continue to hew to the idea that we need budget stability, and that means everybody coming together. And not this idea and that idea and that idea, but one that everybody can agree to. And we haven't seen that yet, and it's the end of the fiscal year. Mr. Secretary, eight, just, just, eight, to, just, just real, let me finish. Quick point eight on that. Just times, a quick point on eight that. Eight times, that the, in a, eight times in a row. So that's going to have an effect. You've had the minority leader risk. of the United States Senate filibuster the defense appropriations bills, not three times, as my colleagues have said, six times in the last year and a half. So let me, let we're me, trying to make that happen. Happen and thank um, you. Let, we are all trying to make that happen. Thanks. Let me let me go on. There's another thing that's of substantive importance, other than the budget instability in the last few years, and that is the services. And I think General, I think you you mentioned General Milley. He he in particular, and I want to associate myself with this, is trying to move to full spectrum. Exactly the words you used from an army that we dedicated almost wholly in terms of force structure to the coin fights that we had to conduct in Iraq and Syria. So, so the Army's been resourcing them heavily. Now he is trying to get his, um, uh, his, his forces trained for full spectrum combat. And as I think as he said to you, that's a matter of budget stability, yes, but it's also gonna, it, it also is a matter of time and he's working on it. That's his highest priority and I agree with him for the U.S. Army. He's trying to get all his brigade combat teams to go through the Nellis, the CTC at Nellis. That's gonna take some time. If we go to the Marine Corps, and I know General Neller spoke to you about that, their highest readiness priority, which I also want to footstomp, as I'm sure he did, is in their aviation. 
and there are a lot of different dimensions to that. One is, is, is the recap of their aviation, both rotary wing and with the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter coming down the line. Uh, with the Navy, it's mostly a matter of ship maintenance, depot maintenance, and Admiral Richardson's working on that. In the Air Force for General Goldfein, the Air Force continues to uh, have readiness challenges which are um, uh, associated partly with budget instability but mostly with the high op tempo of the Air Force. We're working the United States Air Force really hard in that air campaign over in Iraq and Syria. It's essential, it's important, but it means that, that air wings are, are, are constantly rotated in and out and when they come back they have to go back in for for readiness uh, 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 training. So in the budget we submitted for FY17, and we said this, readiness and, and um, uh, resourcing our read, uh, the readiness uh, plans of each of the services was our highest priority. So there's no question about it. There's risk there. It has accumulated over the years. Uh, we need stability and we need priority in order to um, uh, work through it. Uh, we need stability from you. We'll give it priority, and I totally support the Chiefs and what they told you last week. Senator Cruz, in just a second, uh, Mr. Secretary, the impression that was given by the service chiefs was it comes down to readiness, training, spare parts, all the things that go when you have budget cutbacks. We've seen the movie before. So, although, as you pointed out, each individual's service has some specific needs, it all comes back to funding for operational readiness and training, which is always the first to go. And that's obviously when we have U.S. pilots flying less hours per month than Chinese or Russian pilots, there's something fundamentally wrong. And I know you agree with that, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Secretary Carter, General Dunford. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your testimony uh, on the critical national security threats facing our country. For the last seven years, we've had an administration that has in many ways neutered itself and ignored one transgression after another from our enemies. And as a result, our adversaries are continuing to increase their belligerence. Iran has received no meaningful repercussions for illegally seizing American sailors and endeavoring to humiliate them, and has since increased their aggressive tactics and harassment of U.S. Navy vessels operating in the Arabian Gulf. For months, Russia has been ramping up the pressure on our military, previously flying within 30 feet of a U.S. Navy warship, and most recently flying within 10 feet of a U.S. Navy surveillance aircraft. And instead of treating these as escalatory acts from an adversary, Secretary Kerry rewarded Russia by agreeing to share intelligence in Syria. And these examples don't even touch on Iranian and North Korean efforts to develop their ICBM programs, nor the expansion of ISIS beyond the Middle East. Sadly, this week's terror attacks in New York, Minnesota, and New Jersey once again demonstrated that radical Islamic terrorism continues to threaten our safety. By any reasonable estimate, we can conclude that our national security interests are at serious risk. And I want to thank both of you for your service during such a pivotal and dangerous time in our nation's history and for your leadership of our men and women in uniform. I want to ask you, starting with Iran, what is and what should be our response to escalating Iranian belligerence and threats? Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Senator, for that. And, and you hit them all, uh, the five parts of our uh, military strategy uh, that uh, are reflected in what we're trying to get in our budget, namely uh, uh, counter ISIL, Iran, North Korea, Russia, and China. All of those are present very different but serious challenges that have a, a serious military dimension uh, to them. With respect to Iran, notwithstanding the nuclear deal, which uh, was good in the sense that it removed, if, if implemented 
faithfully, which it has been so far, removed nuclear weapons from our concerns about Iran, it did nothing to alleviate other concerns we have, their malign influence, their support for terrorism, malign influence in the region. And this is why, uh, to give you uh, one answer uh, to your question, I'll ask the chairman to uh, pitch in, why we have a strong, ready presence in the Gulf gets back to our readiness discussion. It's not just about ISIL. Uh, we have a big op tempo to defeat ISIL. We're going to do that. It takes a lot of, 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 of force uh, structure, but also uh, readiness consumed uh, doing that, consumed uh, in a good thing because we're defeating ISIL. But we are also standing strong in the Gulf. That means defending our friends and allies there, defending our interests, um, and uh, countering Iranian malign influence. So it, it, it is an enduring commitment of ours. Uh, let me ask the chairman to join in. Senator, I think this, from a military perspective, there's three uh, things that we need to do. Number one is we need to make sure that the inventory of the joint force can deal with Iranian challenges that do range from ballistic missile defense to the malign influence that you spoke about earlier. Number two, we need to make sure in our day-to-day -day operations we make it clear that we're going to sail, fly, and operate wherever international law allows us to and will continue to do that. Number three, as the Secretary said, we need to have a robust presence uh, in the region that makes it very clear uh, that, uh, that we have the capability to deter and respond to Iranian aggression. Those would be the three elements that we need to have for, from a military perspective to give our President whatever options he may need to have. General, in, in your judgment, was flying $1.7 billion in unmarked cash to give to the Iranian government incentivizing positive behavior from Iran? Senator, I'm not trying to be evasive, but I don't know the details of that arrangement, and it really was a political decision uh, that was made to provide that money, and I don't think it's appropriate that I comment on that. Well, let me ask, ask it this way. Um, I spoke yesterday to Pastor Saeed Abedini, who was one of the American hostages held in Iran. And Pastor Saeed described how, when he was preparing to fly out, that his captors told him they were going to wait until the plane load of cash landed. And if the plane load of cash didn't land, he wasn't flying out. And when $400 million touched down in cash, they allowed him to fly out. Now, under any ordinary use of language, that would seem to be payment of a ransom. Does it concern you if the United States is now in the business of paying ransom to terrorist governments for releasing Americans, the incentive that we face for future terrorists and future terrorist governments to attempt to kidnap and hold for ransom Americans. It, it, Senator, let me just ju jump, jump in here for the, the, the chairman. Uh, we weren't involved in this. Uh, this was the settlement of a legal case. Um, and the uh, that's long-standing. Uh, I don't know all the details of it, and 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 the chairman and I were not involved uh, in that. It is a decision that was taken by the law enforcement and the diplomatic. M community. Mr. I Secretary, I appreciate that, but, but I would like an answer there. from General Dunford to the military question: whether, in his professional military judgment, it concerns him the precedent of paying ransom for Americans to terrorist governments. Senator, w without commenting on whether or not that was ransom, again, because I don't know the details, uh, our policy in the past is that we don't pay uh, ransom for hostages, and I think that's hold us, held us in good stead in the past. But, but again, I, I don't know the arrangements that were made in this particular case, and I can't make a judgment as to whether or not that's what we did. All I've done is read the open source reporting on that. Thank you. Give uh, General Sullivan a chance to ask one more question. Indeed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I just wanted to turn to the issue of the South China Sea. And the uh, international ruling in The Hague put China on the defensive. Mr. Secretary, as you know, a number of us at the Shangri-La Dialogue have been supportive of your efforts. And I, I certainly want to give the administration credit for sending two carrier battle groups uh, to the region together recently. But um, I think a number of us remain concerned about the likelihood of reclamation at the Scarborough Shoal and the ongoing, and it's definitely ongoing from all reports, militarization at Fiery Cross, Subi, and Mischief, Mischief Reef, which was also declared as not 
you know, being within China's territorial realm. So what's the strategy to deter future Chinese reclamation activities in the South China Sea, especially at Scarborough Shoal, and equally, if not more important, what's the plan to respond to ongoing militarization of the land that they've already claimed? Uh, thanks, Senator. I'll start, and then uh, uh, Chairman can join. I'm actually gl uh, uh, glad you raised the issue. We haven't talked much about the Asia-Pacific, but you know a great deal about it, and I appreciate that uh, Chairman McCain always leads a delegation uh, out there to, to, to Shangri-La because it shows the persistence of the American presence in that region and the centrality of our continued presence there. Now, the... Uh, what we have stood for there uh, now for many, many years and continue to stand for, and the reason why so many countries are associated are their, themselves with us, and increasingly so, is we stand for principle. And one of those principles is the rule of law. So the decision did come down, uh, and our, 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 our we didn't take a position in the disputes themselves. We do support the decision of the court. Uh, China's rejection of that is having the effect, you ask, well, so what's the reaction to all this? Uh, uh, the effect of uh, causing countries there to express their concern by wanting to do more with us. And uh, uh, we like building the security network there. Uh, we're not trying to do that against China, but if China chooses to exclude itself in this way, uh, this is the, the development that occurs. So we're working more with each and every country there. We find them increasingly coming to us, and we are continuing to operate there as we always have and always will. And last, I guess I should say, uh, in terms of investments, uh, in addition to putting a lot of our force structure there, which you're very familiar with, and I'm grateful that your state hosts uh, 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 some of that, including some of our most modern stuff, we're making a number of qualitative investments in, and that's one of the things that's reflected in our, our, our budget. And one reason why we hope that in addition to funding our budget, we, nobody shuffles around in our budget stuff that we, new stuff that is oriented toward the high end for old force structure. And we've seen a tendency uh, towards that. So we're reacting in a number of ways in terms of our own activities and investments. But the most important thing that's, that's going on is in the region itself. Let me to ask the chairman to add. So I, I think a response to the challenge you identified clearly is going to require diplomatic action, economic action, and military action. So I'll talk to the military piece of this, which right now is, is actually, I don't think, the most prominent piece in dealing with the challenge of China. But I think from my perspective, we need to do a couple of things. Number one, militarily, we need to recognize the implications of the militarization of the South China Sea, and our plans need to be adjusted accordingly. Number two, we need to continue to fly, sail, and operate wherever international law uh, allows and make it very clear that we're doing that on a routine basis. And number three, we need to make sure that our posture in the Pacific assures our allies and deters any potential uh, aggression by China and makes it absolutely clear that we have the wherewithal, uh, both within the alliance uh, as well as U.S. capabilities, to do what must be done vis-a-vis -vis China. So I think if we provide the president with, uh, with clear options, uh, I think we will have done our job. But primarily right now, I think the president is, uh, is, has some diplomatic and economic issue, uh, areas where also will contribute to uh, moderating China's behavior. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and let me say that I hold uh, uh, both of these witnesses in high regard. I appreciate their distinguished career of service. I do have a, a statement for uh, Secretary Carter followed by a question. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in his farewell speech to the UN General Assembly on Tuesday, President Obama stated, there is no ultimate military victory to be won in Syria. As a member of this committee for many years, I find this assertion to be astounding. Our chairman and I, along with other members of this committee, have made repeated admonitions over the years that decisive action needs to be taken against President Assad. In August 2012, the president delivered his now infamous red line statement in which he said, we have been very clear to the Assad regime that a red line for us is we start seeing a whole bunch of chemical weapons moving around or being utilized. That would change my calculus. That would change my equation. 
Now, Mr. Secretary, a year later, disregarding the counsel of your predecessor, Secretary Hagel, the President canceled airstrikes against Assad, who had unleashed sarin gas on his own people outside of Damascus and continued his gruesome use of barrel bombs on civilians. This dramatic demonstration of weakness by the President left a vacuum in the region that was quickly seized by President Putin. We are now faced with an enduring quagmire. Sadly, President Obama's stunning remark that there is no ultimate military victory belies the reality of the Obama foreign policy that has ignored and belittled the advice of our leaders in the Department of Defense. To add insult to injury, the President issued a memo yesterday ordering you and General Dunford to consider climate change during our military planning process. Last weekend, we dealt with, a multiple, with multiple terrorist attacks on our shores. Last night, we heard that ISIL may have launched a chemical attack on our troops. It boggles the mind that the President would, would issue such an order during this critical time in our history. 400,000 civilian deaths in Syria. I wonder what the carbon footprint of these barrel bombs would have been that we could have prevented had we acted decisively. Mr. Secretary, I have the highest regard for you as an individual, as I've already stated, and I thank you for your service. I just wish you had been given the appropriate authority by the President to turn this administration's misguided policy around. Now, I was here when this hearing began at 9.30. You've all been, uh, been very patient with your answers, and I know you've discussed this already, Mr. Secretary, but it, at this point, toward the end of this hearing, is there anything else you'd like to add in response to what I've said? Um, it seems the President is, now, is more resolved now than ever to forget his 2012 promises. Um, what's your recommendation as to the future of the Assad regime uh, what about the president's? Uh, what about your statement during confirmation that, as the president has said, Assad has lost his legitimacy and cannot be a part of the long-term future of Syria? Is that statement still operative? Uh, I, I I think it is. I, uh, I now I'll just give a general answer to your your, your general question. You're right; it was discussed uh, uh, earlier and. Uh, uh, even though we are going to be, I'm confident, militarily successful against ISIL, insofar as the Syrian civil war is concerned, uh, the violence can't end there until there's a political transition from Assad to a government that is decent and that can govern the Syrian people and put that tragically broken country uh, back together. That doesn't look in sight now. It is what we talked earlier about Secretary Kerry's trying to uh, uh, make arrangements to uh, uh, promote, uh, but it is that's necessary uh, for the uh, uh, resolution of what is, as you say, a very tragic situation. Let me see if the chairman wants to add anything. Well, let me just ask this, if, if you don't mind, Secretary Carter. Uh, it, it would help if the barrel bombing ended, and I spoke to um, a Democratic colleague of mine today, uh, I've been calling for a, a no-fly zone to stop the barrel bombing, and I asked this, this colleague of mine on the other side of the aisle if he would support that, and he said, yes. I, he said, I want to call it something else rather than a no-fly zone, but, it, but, but that this particular uh, senator, it, it, it is a fact that this particular senator has now changed his position and would like us to take action to, present, to prevent the barrel bombing. What is your position uh, about that? And wouldn't it help if we took decisive action and, and ended this carnage? Uh, it, it, I don't know the specific proposal that which you're discussing with your uh, colleague. Uh, make one comment and then see if the chairman wants to add. I anything. think he was talking about a no fly zone. Well, but, okay. but described in more palatable I, terms. It, it, there are a number of different proposals have been made, but I, the one I, that I think it, the focus on right now uh, is the one Secretary Kerry's trying to promote, namely a no-fly zone for the Russians and the Syrians who are attacking the Syrian people. 
if they're talking about a no-fly zone for American aircraft fighting ISIL, uh, needless to say, um, that that's not going to get any enthusiasm, uh, get strong opposition from I'm speaking me. About but it, but uh, I think that's what it's, sec but, but uh, yeah, it's not called that, but Secretary Kerry's trying to get a stand down of the Syrian and Russian uh, Air Force. And if he's successful, that would be a good thing. You can ask the chairman if he has anything to add. Senator, the only thing I'd say is, you know, as the situation on the ground changes, I think I have a responsibility, we, the Joint Force, has a responsibility to make sure the President has a full range of options. We have discussed that issue in the past under certain conditions. The conditions on the ground will change, and we'll continue to look at those options and make sure they're available to the President. What about the option of controlling the airspace so that, that barrel bombs cannot be dropped? All, all the options. Uh, what they, do you think of that option, sir? Uh, right now, Senator, for us to control all of the airspace in Syria would require us to go to war against Syria and Russia. That's a pretty fundamental decision that certainly I'm not going to make. To impose a no-fly zone. Chairman, Chairman, could I for a second say, just answer? No, no. Senator Gillibrand. That's not, that's not what I said, Chairman. Go ahead. Well, uh, yeah, I do think what, what, Senator, what the Senator asked me was to control all of the airspace. No, what he asked was, should we have a no-fly zone I, so we can protect these people from I, being slaughtered? I, That's what he's talking about. I answered about. that first. That's what we're all talking about. So that would not require going to war full scale, would it? Not necessarily, Senator. I, I, I'm sorry, but I tried to answer the first question first, and then I was responding to the second part of your question. But that, I did not mean to say that imposing a no-fly zone would require us to go to war. That's not the question I was answering. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for testifying today. Uh, I want to uh, continue some of the issues that Senator Fisher brought up about cyber. Um, in the past year, we've learned, obviously, about a number of cyber attacks, whether it was against the DNC or against NSA or the Office of Personal Management. And these attacks have demonstrated the integrated nature of our networks and how, our, how targeting one system can have a broader effect. Whether it's critical infrastructure, private companies, or political party networks, we need to have a much more integrated response to these attacks. How can we create an integrated framework for response to hacks and cyber attacks, and what is DOD's role, and are the processes and authorities now in place for DOD to respond in a systemic way rather than ad hoc to each attack? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start, and you, you, you used the phrase, uh, Senator, and thank you, that I would use as well, which is an integrated approach, uh, because you don't necessarily know at the beginning who the perpetrator is, and there's this whole spectrum of possible uh, and actual perpetrators ranging from criminals and kids right up to nation states, and you're right, it's, it is, the, de the Defense Department shares this responsibility with law enforcement and homeland security and intelligence, but we aim to play a big role, big, a very big supporting role. Our first job is the defense of our own networks. That's our highest priority within the DOD cyber system because we depend so abjectly upon those systems for the performance of our military overall. All our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, ships, planes, and tanks, and some of their network together, in order to function as excellently as they do, those networks need to be secure. That's our first job. Uh, we also do uh, 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 develop cyber uh, uh, offense. We've acknowledged that in the last uh, yeah, year. Yeah, and, and I and, really and, appreciate the work you're doing on innovation. I think the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental that you started in Silicon Valley and now have expanded to both Boston and Austin is really exciting. And I actually would invite you to look at New York for your next site because we have so many venture capital, high tech developing there. It's becoming sort of this new Silicon Valley. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the committee's support for DIUX. It's, it's one of many things we're trying to do to continue to connect our Defense Department to the most innovative parts of American society, get good people to want to join us or our defense companies, good, good scientists and engineers, and um, uh, let them uh, feel the 
uh, meaning of contributing to national defense. And we got to work extra hard at that simply because generationally, a lot of young people haven't served. They may be cyber experts, they haven't served, they've never worked with or for our department before, and so we're really working hard to draw them in. I just opened up the DIUX branch in Austin, uh, and there'll be more, and I appreciate that. And appreciate I'd be grateful if York. there's any further uh, authorities or resources you need to continue to develop the strongest cyber force we possibly can, if you could give that to me so I can put it in the next NDAA, because I think this effort you're doing needs thoughtful and continu continual investment of thinking and uh, resources. So. To Thank the extent you. you. We'll, we'll, give, further, we'll you. give you more. I should say it's strongly represented in our FY17 budget because yep. we gave it a lot of priority. And, and the reason why it was uh, possible to give it priority is not just because of its importance, but because it's not just a matter of money. It's, as you indicate, it's a matter of good people. Right. They're the hard thing to find in cyber. And, we and, need to and lastly, I just want to continue on Senator McCaskill's line of questioning. Um, we've been really looking at this issue of retaliation very hard. We've made it a crime for several years. Uh, but the 62% of retaliation being reported over and over again is very challenging. And those being reported, uh, their view is that it's from uh, above them in the chain of command uh, more often than not. So that's just what we're working with. And it's a perception, not necessarily a defined uh, enumerated crime. I fully understand that. But have you done any prosecutions of retaliation this year? Have you actually taken any cases to court martial yet? I, I can't answer that question. I believe the answer to that is yes, um, and I'll get back to you on that, uh, yeah. Senator. But can I just thank you for, I think you, among others on this committee, were the ones who really tuned us in to retaliation as another dimension of the sexual assault problem we needed to combat. We are trying to, you're right, sometimes it's it's higher up, but sometimes it is laterally also. Yeah, and, uh, and all of those reasons, whether it's lateral or higher up, is one of the reasons why survivors don't report. It's one of their enumerated reasons. They feel it will end their career. And we still only have two out of 10 survivors reporting. So we're not where we need to be. It's not good enough. And right. I, I'm grateful for your continued efforts. Thank you, likewise. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can assure the senator from New York, as long as I'm chairman of this committee, we will not take away the responsibility of the commanding officer, the chain of command, as hard as she may try to remove that. Senator King, did you have anything else? Just one quick question to follow up on this line of questioning about uh, cyber. Uh, gentlemen, do you believe that we should separate, uh, or, or I'm sorry, that cyber command should be elevated to a uh, independent combatant command? Uh, Senator, that's not a decision we've taken yet, but I think that's going to be a natural evolution uh, for us um, and is going to be part of the, of the natural evolution of our cyber force in giving this uh, uh, new priority. So we are looking at the various managerial uh, aspects of cyber. Uh, Chairman and I discuss that frequently. We discuss it with our colleagues around Washington and the, and the, and the, and the intelligence community with which we share a lot of it of uh, responsibility. I mean, ultimately, something that involves combatant commanders will be a presidential decision, but this committee I, will have a big role in that as well. So we look forward to working with you as we make that evolution. But we're I, thinking I, about it, absolutely. I just hope the evolution takes a little less time than the evolution of human beings. <laughs> I think it will. <laughs> the Secretary, it's been a long morning for you and General Dunford, but I would just like to ask one additional question. This news of this uh, chemical, what appears to be a chemical weapon yesterday, can you tell us what you know about that and what any conclusions you may have reached on that? Uh, a absolutely, we can. Uh, go ahead, Chairman. Chairman, it's a, we, we assess it to be a sulfur mustard blister agent. Uh, we don't assess that ISIL has, the, it has a very rudimentary capability to deliver that. Uh, it went on one of our bases. We have uh, effective detection equipment there. We have effective protection equipment. We can also decontaminate. But, uh, and, and we also are tracking a number of targets. One we struck last week, 
which is a pharmaceutical plant, uh, which is part of the, of the chemical warfare network that ISIL has. And so we have been tracking this. We've had a number of strikes, I think 30 over the past year, against emerging cap chemical capability. And uh, in this latest strike, again, we assess was uh, sulfur mustard. None of our folks were injured by this particular incident, and it, and it wasn't a particularly effective, but it was a concerning uh, uh, development. It is concerning because we have known that they had some kind of chemical weapons facility there in Raqqa, and, and as you say, we have struck it, but it is uh, concerning particularly on those people who don't have the protective equi equipment as well. I thank, you. I thank the witnesses. I know it's been a long morning, and I appreciate uh, their being here, and uh, we will look forward to perhaps in the lame duck session, trying to get them the authorization that they require in order to carry out their responsibilities. And I am not proud of the fact that the Congress of the United States has not carried out ours. I thank the witnesses. This hearing is adjourned.